on your Jump, 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 jump What we done started Look at what we done started This the people party What's up, party people in the place to be? You're now rocking with Talib Kweli, the BKMC. This is the People's Party. Welcome back to another fantastic episode and edition. Give it up to my lovely co-host, Jasmine Lee, in the place to be. What's up? Yes. Jazz, what's going on? I'm double thinking the Sphinx I put on. That's what's going on. <laughs> T-M-I. <laughs> this episode is not about your Sphinx. <laughs> <laughs> this episode... <laughs> is featuring another friend of mine. I love having friends with People's Party. This is a guy I've known for 20 years plus. This is a guy that when I first started my career before I was famous as an artist, I was running the streets of New York City with this young man. Um, he has worked with some of the biggest names in hip hop and is responsible for some of the biggest and best records of hip hop, but not just records that were like hits, records that defined an era. He has made era defining classics. From Kanye West to Black Star to Kid Cudi to the Far Side, man, this guy has worked with like some of my favorite artists. Um, he was there when my children were born. Wow. He was there when I first learned how to DJ. He was in the crib dancing at my parties. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for 88 Keys. I thought the backflip was coming. <laughs> nah, see, I was, I was, I was thinking about it, but I was like, man, let me not completely play myself. We um do a contest for best walk-ons, <laughs> and we don't tell everybody. It's got to be oh. natural. You just, you stepped it up right there. I, did I liked I, it. But did I win? I don't know. Anthony Anderson was pretty good. Oh. <laughs> that was close though. Anthony. <laughs> now, now, now he's my arch nemesis. What's up, eh? Man, chilling. How you feeling, bro? Man, I'm feeling uh I'm feeling a little spicy from the food that I just had. What you there. eat? Uh the jerk and some the gentrified other... Jamaican food. Yeah, yeah. We film in LA <laughs> and uh I'm not I enjoy it. We just had some festival that she didn't like. And because she didn't oh, there was like a festival here? No, the festival like the the the, the oh, I thought you meant right. like the the, you know. the festival. Yeah. <laughs> she didn't like it so uh, uh, basically it's made by white people now. <laughs> no. oh, yeah. And it comes with kale. So I mean <laughs> Yeah, there was kale in there. Uh but um you know uh but no I, I feel I feel good. I feel good. good. I feel spicy. Good. Well let's get into it. Yeah. Um you were born in up in the Bronx where the people are fresh. Yes, in the BX. That's right. The, the home of hip hop. Yes, the home and actually uh from what I was told before I was born, my family lived in uh Cedric. Okay. And they lived, I think, in the neighboring uh, What's building. that building number? It's 1540? Cedric? Man, we should know this. We should know this as people who do hip-hop. The building where hip-hop was started at. Y yeah, but unfortunately, we do not know it. That's right. Somebody in the comments section. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Look down, the comments right there. Okay. Um, oh, okay, that's where it's at. Your parents are from Cameroon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My uh, my my father, who uh, uh, you know, he passed in 2015. Uh, Rest in he, peace. Oh, uh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, he's. Uh, they were both from Cameroon. Uh, here's the weird thing. Um, both That's of my parents, Africa for people who don't know. Yeah, no, West Side <laughs> um, of Africa. Um, yeah, it's, it's neighboring uh, Nigeria and the Ivory Coast. Mm -hmm. So the funny thing is, um, my parents they're both from Cameroon, born born and raised, and <clears throat> my mother she speaks. 25 different dialects of wow. of of uh languages from Cameroon and mm. she also speaks a little bit of German cuz she went to boarding school okay. uh in Germany. My dad he speaks his language which I I failed to remember the the name of the language but they don't speak each other's language. Ah. So they only The language of love. Yeah, that and uh English. Right. Um I thought it was French cuz we had Gina uh Ishere, who was a comedian whose parents are from Nigeria. Yeah, well there's yeah, they're supposed to speak French. But well, that's what she said. She yeah. said that, you know, she talked about uh, not wanting to say she was African. She said, she because, you know, they would be made fun of in London. And she mm -hmm. said, I would tell people I'm not African. I'm from Cameroon. Oh. <laughs> she said, because they, they speak French there. Oh, okay, okay. Well, yeah, you know, it's funny because uh, I used to not claim being African in the 80s. Yeah, it was uh, tough times. Extremely tough. Yeah. Um, especially after, like, Delirious came out. <laughs> you was, mean raw? Was, we were just oh yeah, raw, that. raw, raw. With the yeah, 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 raw, raw, raw. Yep, yeah. you're right. Um, Explain that to us, man. So growing up in the '80s in the Bronx, well, I was, 
I was born in 76, but, you know, growing up in the mm -hmm. 80s as a, as a child in the Bronx, uh, East Chester. Mm -hmm. um, I was, uh, what was it? Which The name of the block was like 223rd in East Chester um, uh, by Edenwall Projects. Uh, yeah, it was just it was just rough for it for for Africans because Jamaicans were cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. Jamaicans they were always cool because mm -hmm. you know uh, the patois mm -hmm. and just like the um, bad boys, bad boys. <laughs> what you're going to like? Just like the, the whole aesthetic of <laughs> being a Jamaican, Jamaican, it was like fresh, <laughs> you know. Um, and to be honest, I don't even know if if there were any Haitians in my area. Mm -hmm. But you know what? There could have been Haitians, but they were probably Pretending just like Africans. To be Jamaican. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what the Haitians did in my neighborhood. Oh, they uh, back because then? Because the Haitians was picked on by the other people from the Caribbean. Okay, so they was right in the yep. same boat. Yep. They like, pretend to be Jamaican. Yeah. So um so yeah, so I, I couldn't I you know I couldn't admit to being an African and stuff. Because you know, like the stereotypes about Africans who were like um you know, we, we wore bones in our noses and stuff. Mm -hmm. And oddly enough, now I got my second pair. So, <laughs> FO, y'all. FO, it's cool now. I wish I had a bone. Um, oh, God. Uh, yeah, bones through the noses. Uh, you know, we, you know, our, our pets were goats and stuff. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think our pet was a goat. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Jamaican eat goats. When, when did you get over that and start um, owning it? I got over it uh, eighth grade. Eighth grade. So my family, uh, you know, Roman Catholic. My, my mother, she was a Protestant, but, you know, my dad, Roman Catholic, and, you know, he ran the household as Roman Catholic. Myself and my older brother and three older sisters. So it's five of us in the household. And um, so all up until that time, I went to Catholic school. I used, I begged my parents to take me out of Catholic school because, so our uniform, like before, before sixth grade, our uniforms were, Dark brown, like doo doo brown oh, no. pants. Doo doo brown. Doo doo brown pants. Piss yellow shirt. Ew. No, I swear to God. Doo doo brown pants. Piss yellow shirt. Um, and our uh, the plaid was like forest green and gray. Plaid. I used to wear that. I used to go to school called Junior Academy. I wore the same colors. Ew. For real? Yeah. Oh, I thought that was just like that was just, like the official New York City school serious school colors man Mine it was, was navy blue and yellow that that's what i was used to seeing like, <laughs> every, like everybody else had fresh colors like you know scarlet i mean it's uh right meanwhile we in, we the colors of vomit yeah and piss <laughs> Pit, vomit piss and poop right um yeah i went to our lady of grace on bronxwood i don't man you're right it's all coming back to me um <laughs> i had spoken to him about this he said my memory is terrible i'm not gonna remember anything i said i'm gonna ask the questions in a way that's gonna trigger your memory Good and job. triggers are being pulled right now <laughs> um yeah so so i begged i begged them to for me to go to uh, uh public school just so i could like not wear these colors and mm -hmm. stuff like that so i went to public school uh, i went to uh ps 142 john Philip Sousa junior high school principal was dr brindle he walked around with a bat. So um, they call him a Batman. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm the HNIC. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure he watched that movie. Okay. I was like, "Are you quoting lean on me right now?" <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, they used to call him a crazy joke. Now they call him a Batman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so that so seventh grade seventh grade was uh, was brand new to me, but then by eighth grade. I was the man in the in the school, like, and I'm sure f Facebook is gonna like contest this. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, no. So, 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 I learned how to. I taught myself how to dance from watching, uh, you know, Video Music Box, mm -hmm. and then watch. But my crossover into dancing was when I watched The Boys. Ah, the Hakeem Apollo. and them. Yeah, at the Apollo. Shout out to Hakeem and the Boys. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They yeah. like have like a vegan business now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, you know, I taught myself how to dance. Um, I was always short, but I had uh, I convinced my parents to allow me to have the Gumby haircut. The Gumby was important. I had a Gumby, but my shit had like steps in it. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that, like, didn't True Goy have that? Oh. Gumby. Didn't True Goy have that? Like, it, his his was like the nappy version. Oh, okay, I had, okay. Like, the clean oh, the actual version. Stuff. Of it. <laughs> Gumby, yeah. You had the the, the interior decorated. Like. Yeah, my shit was like a marble staircase. <laughs> Gumby. What was Gumby for the people who don't know? Yeah. Gumby, do oh, so do you know what a Gumby? Is? I, in a cartoon. Well, yeah. But yeah, Gumby but, is the hairstyle. I know, but I, it derived. Oh, from oh, the cartoon for, that's right. Yeah, because it made your head look like 
Gumby. Like Gumby, yeah. Like I'm some, Gumby, damn it. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and and that year, I also bagged the baddest chick in the school, Nicole McWhite. Right. Um, for everybody who's watching, uh, bagged is s- slang for I got her phone number. He didn't actually put her in a bag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or did I? <laughs> Relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give me two to yeah. my show. <laughs> Shit. Um, Are you my scene? Oh, uh, no. I, I kid. I kid. He kids. He kids. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I have kids. I have and daughters. He also has kids. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so, yeah. So, so by eighth grade, you know, my confidence was through the roof. I also had a, a very close friend who, like, we were around the same height, and he had that flat top, mm-hmm. and he was the man in, in the school as well, and then we just, like, kind of linked up, and then, you know, he brought me around to so his So y'all people. had the ill hair because then the dancing. Mm-hmm. That's where your love yeah. of dancing started because you dance all the time. I found a, I found I dance coming in. He did. I <laughs> found footage of a rehearsal I had <laughs> when I was hiring DJ Chaps. <laughs> But it's like a rehearsal at 88 Keys for some reason. Because I don't invite him. You know what I'm saying? Oh, my God. For some reason, he's always there. Yeah. <laughs> at these moments in my life. I show up. He shows up. He pulls up. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm rehearsing my band for the Erica Badu Mama's Gun Tour. And there's footage of me rehearsing my band. And then the camera pans. And it's 88 Keys just dancing <laughs> by himself in the studio while we rehearse. Does not matter. Like, you know, uh, music just moves me mm-hmm. and yeah, it, it, it just, it, I don't know, it just loosens my joints and I feel, <laughs> I feel real good. With, I mean, no, no, when, like, yeah, m- music just moves me and I, I actually, I don't care who's around mm-hmm. to- Dance like no one is watching eight. Yeah. You know, like that's dance fever. That's, how, that's exactly how I live my life. Yes, I know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know. Yeah. But, now, um, your story to me is sort of- a Long Island story. Crib. Mm. It's a story mm. of, she's from Roosevelt. All do, West all, Hampstead. All connect. Rose lead there Roosevelt, for some reason baby. on the show. <laughs> um, your story, Long Island for people who understand hip hop for real. Mm. They understand the impact of Long Island, what Long Island represents, yeah. but it still feels underrepresented no matter what. No, no matter, matter what. how many Rakims, public enemies, uh, uh, leaders of new schools, mm. you know, no matter how many 88 keys come Plus out the of rhymes. De La Soul. Oh, I could tell you why. I mean, mm-hmm. my, th- me why. my thought is because cats from Long Island, well, at least back then, you know, I don't even, like, I'm 43 now, so I'm not in the mix anymore. Mm-hmm. But back then, it's like nobody, they didn't claim it. Mm-hmm. They didn't claim it. So it's like, you know, you had cats who lived there all their lives and they were like, yo, I'm from Brooklyn. Oh yeah, now I was born in a hospital in Brooklyn. <laughs> I moved here when I was three. Right, but like I'm from Brooklyn. Yeah, I'm from Brooklyn. Because it was like it wasn't hard to say you was from Long Island. Yeah, yeah, like you were not hard at all. And 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 there were there are neighborhoods on Long Island that's, that's hard. like extremely hard, hard. Mm-hmm. With, the, with, with, a, with the hard with, with, yeah with the yeah with yeah. the with the with the o, with the or horde 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 it was horde, horde. horde. It was horde. <laughs> you know and they had hoarders because we had houses right you know um, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Lawns and shit. Yeah, and grass, you know. trees. Yeah. De La Soul really went out their way to really represent Long Island and not and represent the Long Island lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To not pretend they were anything other than they were. And shout out to Prince Paul. Yes. You know, talk about the influence of Prince Paul on hip hop in your or your life. Well, here, here's the thing. Um, actually, it's funny because it had uh, a negative impact at first. So. You know, De La Soul came out, what was it, 88, 89? I was still 80, living- 88, yeah. 88. So I was still living on in uh, in the Bronx. Plug, uh, plug one, plug two, two. plug two in. Yeah, cause I, cause I, remember, I remember the first time I heard that, uh, Red Alert spun it on Kiss. And I didn't know what I was listening to. And this is, you know, uh, of course, you know, uh, EPMD, uh, Kane on the right. radio and stuff like that, like all these like. How could I have not mention EPMD when I was running down those long? long oh records? yeah, I mean that's I, yeah. well, you know. Um, but uh, so so back then, like actually, I feel like that's probably what prompted me getting the Gumby haircut. You know, because mm-hmm. like you know, true boy, true, or Pass. Like remember Pass? He had he had like the step thing. Yeah, going the step. On. See, we was uh, De La Soul. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but so so back then, I was in eighth grade, and even though I was popping. I shouldn't even say that. <laughs> even though I was, you know, own it. I was, I was popping. God own damn it! it. <laughs> you know, I, I was highly favored. Right. Um, blessed and blessed and yeah. and uh, you know, but I loved De La Soul mm-hmm. and I yeah, used we to, all. 
Well, you know, the thing is, like, I feel like cats, they they, they liked them back then, like, in my area, in the Bronx, but they wouldn't um, admit to it. Mm. And I was admitting to it, and people made fun of me. That's interesting. Yeah. For me, Daylight was so liberating because it was like they created that lane for me. Yeah. And hip, Drunk Jungle Brothers as well. Mm. Yeah. You know, Red Alert, Jungle Brothers. But Daylight, uh, Day, Daylight spoke to me more because Jungle Brothers was still, at that moment in my life, it was uptown. Mm. It looked it looked kind of rough and rugged. They had on like the the, the forty below boots. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, the yeah. vest is like we we going. I was too young to go out in the world. Yeah, Jungle yeah. Brothers looked like they was out in the in the jungle. Yeah, yeah, you know, straight exactly. out the jungle. I didn't want to be in the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> but De La Soul. Oh, and, because Africans see. Africans see. Yeah, <laughs> it all comes back. Right. De La Soul with that video for me myself and I in school. Yeah, that was my experience being the weird kid in school. Mm. So when I saw them owning that in the video, I was like, that's me. Yeah, yeah. No, 100%. Mm-hmm. Actually, you know what? Man, triggers. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I, I actually had a rap group back then uh, called The Village Idiots. Mm. And, uh, you know, I you know I was leaning more towards like a De La Souza. I mean, I didn't know anything about producing or anything. Mm-hmm. So we were just rapping on people's like uh, singles and stuff mm-hmm. like that. The B-side always wins. The B-side always mm-hmm. wins. Um, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, I got made fun of. But then when I moved to Long Island... Um, you know, I actually hooked up with uh, a, a a friend, like one of my first friends in high school, who is now like uh, a high executive at Live Nation, mm-hmm. um, Christian McKnight. Mm-hmm. Uh, like we linked because he saw how I was dressing. I think I had, um, and this is before I started rocking polo. Like mm-hmm. this is like first day of school, and I, I think I had cowrie shells or whatever. Mm-hmm. I had the uh, what was that uh, that pullover with the. Uh, it looked like a potato sack almost, and it had like the, <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you know uh, what I'm talking about. It looked like a poncho. It was called, yeah, it looked like a poncho. It was called uh, it, the hippie kids used to wear. Them. Yeah, yeah, like like cats who used to play the hack, you know, do yeah, the hacky yeah, sack. Yeah, and all it looked that. like yeah. the same material a hacky sack was made out of. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like so you're wearing a burlap sack with a hood. <laughs> yep. What's that yeah. called? Somebody. I didn't know hacky sack. Back there, somebody tell me. <laughs> Garrett? Anybody? Garrett? Anybody? <laughs> Our neighborhood whites. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so so I was wearing that, and uh, this kid was like, "Hey, you like a tribe called Quest?" I was like, oh boy, do I? <laughs> and then our friendship was sealed and, you know, yeah, to that day, I mean, to this day rather. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, but yeah, th- thinking back about the impact of of hip hop on Long Island and rappers who came out of Long Island, um, I lived in West Hempstead and I lived on a block called Eagle Avenue and on Eagle Avenue and a, a major uh, street called uh, Woodfield Road, mm-hmm. there was a barbershop, or there is a barbershop called Star Salon. Mm-hmm. The owner of Star Salon is is uh, is a reverend. We all call him Rev. Cool nickname. Um, his son, well, one of his many sons was Onyx the Birthstone Kid, you know, from KMD. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so KMD was predominantly, or they were all from Long Beach, which is like a few towns away from uh, West Hempstead. But they filmed um, uh, who? Yeah, I think they filmed who me right there on the corner. Oh, uh, you Peach Fuzz? Yeah. Oh no, no, no. Well, no. Pe- uh, Peach, Peach Fuzz was out, but right. like who me? Like okay. they filmed it right there oh, okay, in, okay. in the corner. So uh, I was like, so that was like my first brush with like a real like rappers, mm. and professional rappers. I was like, oh, this is crazy. Shout out to Cam D. Rest in peace, Sub Rock. Sub Rock. Shout yeah. out to M of Doom. Yeah, Dingalese Way Doomale. You know. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, hip hip hop was like around you know and you know we all listen to it uh, you know of course and stuff but yeah i i think i think uh just cats just being afraid to say they're from long island and mm-hmm. wanting to be hard and stuff like that i think that's what kind of like stifled people from knowing you were working in a studio in long island mm-hmm. and you met pete rock and large professor and q-tip and these people right sort of mm-hmm. sort of so um i started interning at uh the studio called the music palace mm-hmm. And from there, um, and then eventually I met this guy named John Carrero. Mm-hmm. Wait, you want a full story? Oh, yeah, we have time. Yeah, you got this. Oh, okay, cool. I was <laughs> 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 right, so about to go in. It's about to go in. <laughs> so the story of 88 Keys, <laughs> the birth. My mom, she was like, uh, uh, nah, so, um, uh, so, all right. Uh, at 14 years old, all right, th- this is the beginning of me going into music. At 14 years old, I, you, you remember, well, there was this radio station, uh, Kiss FM. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I don't that, remember it. I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was, uh, uh, Clue. Nah, um, <laughs> nah so, uh, 
you know, so I was listening to Kiss, and you remember on Sundays they had uh, cool Kiss classics mm -hmm. from eight to like midnight or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you know, my sisters they were heavy into like the music and radio and stuff like that. So I would just like listen to the radio like you know by accident because mm -hmm. I'm just trying to hang out with my sisters and whatever. But I'm like seven years younger than everybody else, so they didn't really want me around. Um, so I heard uh, Roy Ayers Ubiquity. Everybody loves the sunshine. And when I heard that song, I was immediately drawn to the song because I'm thinking like, oh, this is this has to be a like um, a B-side remix to uh, Everybody Loves the Sunshine, uh, Wake Up with the brand, brand Nubians. Nubians. Yeah, right. Because you heard Brand Nubian first. Yeah, I heard Brand Nubian okay. first, and of, and again, this is like before the internet, mm -hmm. so I didn't know anything about producing or sampling or nothing, or anything, anything like that. So you know, but I knew about that the SD Fifties remix that they did. Um, so I heard the song and I was I was drawn to it. I was pulled in, and then uh, you know I wanted to know you know who the who the feature was. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking it's like a feature. Yeah. So I called the radio station. I called. <laughs> you Kiss. called up the. <laughs> well, that wasn't what you played just now. It's the song about sunshine. Yeah. And no. No. But but, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's like I called and I got through on my first call. Mm. Wow. Meant yeah. To be. And, yeah. And that like I, I feel like that doesn't happen. You it know, doesn't. just calling a radio station as big as Kiss. So I called, got through. And I asked them, and they told me, and uh, and they said, "Hey, good luck finding the record." Then I went to uh, went went to the yellow pages. What's from that? Where, I'm just I kidding. Know. <laughs> I, know, I know what the yellow pages. Yeah, the only record shop that I could find was the one that I already knew about that sold like uh, current well current music at the time. You know, hip hop, R and B was is a um, store in Hempstead. They actually sold old records in the back, but you know, not. Not they really. They weren't catalog, probably. Yeah, yeah, more catalog stuff or whatever. So then I asked the owner about the record, and he said, "Well, I know, I know a guy in uh, Malvern, which was on the opposite side of my hometown, uh, West Hempstead. So here's his number. Give him a call. He could probably help you." Called is this guy named Red Carrero, lived in Malvern with his wife Amy, sweet old couple. Gave me the address. Go over uh, after school. I went over to the house. I go to the house and it's it's a two it's a two store house two story house you know with an attic and basement filled with records top to bottom. As soon as you walk in, you see records like in their bathrooms. There's like crates of records wow. and stuff like or boxes of records. So I asked them about it and they were telling me like they said, "Hey, you know we don't have that, but our son might have it." And you know he you know he deals with records too, uh, John Carrero. Mm. So I'm like, all right, cool. He said, hey, if, you know, if you could come back tomorrow, we'll ask him about it. And if he has it, you know, he'll bring it by. <clears throat> so went there the next day, 14 years old, I meet John Carrero. And the on first sight, I'm like scared because this dude looks like Hell's Angels. Long, red hair, the ponytail, tats, black leather vest. You know, like I, I feel like he had like pack of cigarettes like rolled up in a sleeve maybe <laughs> whatever like no he had the, the full like he had the harley in the front whatever mm -hmm. so i asked him if you know he has the record sealed and he hands it to me and uh i'm like i'm looking at the cover and the cover is just like intriguing at, you know you know what the cover looks like i'm like man this this looks mm -hmm. crazy and you know so he charges me for it and then he goes hey what do you you know what do you want with this record i said i don't know i i, I just like the song and he goes, all right. So it sells the records to me. And then uh, I go home and I listen to it on my, on my dad's uh, stereo system. And I, my mind was blown, mm -hmm. like just listening to the record from front, you know, from front to back. And, I, wow. and that was like my first time, like really, I mean, I've heard old music before, mm -hmm. but that's the first time that I've purchased my own record mm -hmm. and my own, you know, and just taking it all in. I was like, and, oh, and, I, and I heard the, um, the song, well, I, no, the far side they weren't out at the time, obviously, but you know they did that remix for uh, uh walk uh, passing me by, mm -hmm. the the flies pie remix or whatever. Yeah, so that was on that. Roy Ayers, right? Yeah, and yeah. and I remember when when I eventually got into sampling, I sampled that like you know like ten years before. So like, <laughs> give me some credit. So so yeah, um, so I, I bought that record, and then eventually I went back to John, and I bought another record, and then he's just like, this is weird, like you're. 14 years old like right. you know what do you what want do you with do? all this old dusty music yeah right. eventually I started working for him and you know I was cleaning his records and then I asked you know he's paying me I was like you know uh, like the money that I like, so I wasn't 
allowed to work. I, I wasn't allowed to get a teen job or anything like mm-hmm. that. So, you know, for me to get these, this money, I had to like uh, not eat lunch mm-hmm. at school. So my lunch money was going towards records. You sacrificed your lunch money yeah, to you know, buy records. Yeah, it's like I, the, the, the records were was feeding that hungry. my- the rec- Yeah, I was that hungry and the records were feeding my soul. That's right. Why were you not allowed? <laughs> 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 Why were you not allowed to work? Um, because my parents are Cameroonian, and it's like school, school, school. So you oh. could be a doctor, doctor, doctor. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, uh, and you know they didn't want any distractions. I couldn't play sports or anything like that. It's like yeah, it's it's real like that. The large professor named you. Yes. So by this time. Uh, working for John, you know, I started to become his ear. So, by the way, so John Carrero, who also uh, passed, mm, uh, rest, in peace. Yeah, rest in peace to John. Uh, I used to call him Crates Carrero. Mm. Um, he was actually one of the biggest record vendors mm-hmm. or record brokers in uh, on the East Coast at the time. Um, and I eventually became his ears mm. where, you know, like, you know, he like he always had his spots where he went digging and like, you know, He'll buy records for like, you know, $4, $8 and then flip them, you know, for like a, a great profit. Um, and then when I became his ears, where it's like, yo, you should buy this. Because by this time, I knew what sampling was, mm-hmm. which is like almost a year later. So you I'm like which 15. records had value? I mean, th- what what that I felt would have value because right. like I didn't, you know, I couldn't like do any list pricing or whatever. But, you know, I was like, yo, I think this could be good for a rap beat or mm-hmm. hip hop beat or whatever. So from there, um, you know, uh, people started like pouring in like, like people of note. So I remember one day and uh, I would never forget this day, you know, 15 years old, I'm at his house and I'm cleaning records and stuff like that. He gets a phone call and he's like, you know, he's on the phone and I'm just like, you know, another customer or whatever, not paying much attention to it or whatever. And then he goes, okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. So, so, uh, your name is Jonathan. All right. And he's writing the thing. Uh, all right, Jonathan Davis. And I heard that. <laughs> and I'm like, nah, nah. And he's still talking. Like, he's like closing the deal or whatever. And I was like, hey, John, John, ask him if 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 uh if he's part of a group called a tribe called Quest. And he goes, Yeah, oh yeah, just one one more thing. Are are, are you part of a tropical quest? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I hit him with this emoji, like. Right. <laughs> you invented that emotion. I, at, at that moment. Oh. At that moment. Give like, him his credit. Right. Yeah, you know. Um, and I was like, no, a, a tribe called Quest. And he goes, oh, he goes, oh, you are? Q-tip. Right. So, to backtrack, I'm all over the place because you asked me about Prince Paul and stuff like that. Um, it's all, these names are incredible, though. Like, this is, you're, you're 15 years old, you said? Yeah. Wow. So, the Prince Paul and... The De La Soul thing, like I always, all right, I fell in love. No, I I liked hip hop a lot by the time I heard EPMD, Special Ed, um, JVC Force and stuff like that. During the, like the Treacherous 3 era and stuff like that, like I was a kid and I, but, and I didn't have an appreciation. Like I liked it, but it was just like, I like. Um, Billy Joel and like uh, Hall and Notes yeah. more because my sisters listen to that more yeah. than you know the hip hop stuff. And then you know the, Billy the, Joel from Long Island. Yeah, I believe I believe so. Or at least Christy Brinkley, I think she was. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Do your goggles. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, you know, so 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 listen, like like listening to hip hop back for me back then, like it was cool. But I didn't I didn't grow a fondness for it because, you know, they were like their the rap the raps and the cadences weren't as advanced mm-hmm. until like, you know, uh Rock Everybody yeah. Rock came came out and stuff like that. And it was basically just drum beats, like, you know, whatever. So like the whole uh run DMC thing, like I, I, I liked it, but I didn't I didn't fall in love with it. So when De La Soul came out, so, I mean, I'm sorry. So, you know, all those other aforementioned rappers came out. I was like, yo, I, yeah, I like this. I like this a lot. And, you know, I was into it. I was buying cassettes and stuff, buying my own tapes. And then when De La Soul came out, that's when, like, there was a, a shift for me. And I was like, yo, this is, not only is it different just for the sake of being different, but it's actually really good. Like, they're not, they're not, I mean, again, I, even though I didn't know 
what sampling was, mm-hmm. but it didn't sound like James Brown right. again. Right, right. right. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it didn't sound like the, the same soul samples and stuff right. like that. So I, I started to grow a connection for it. And, you know, um, and then finding out about like the native tongues that, that was forming, mm-hmm. you know. But then when Tribe came out, when I left my Wa and the El Segundo came out, that completely blew my mm-hmm. mind. And then uh, Bonita Applebaum. And then, uh-huh. so, so, so when the album came out, People's Instinct to Travels in the Past of Rhythm, just looking at the cover yeah. was like ridiculous. Right. You know, and then, you Excellence. know. Yeah, reading the inserts and then seeing that that photo with their, all of them on the brick wall and they're like mm-hmm. looking down and stuff and like how they was dressing and stuff. Yep. And you know me being African and you know the whole Afrocentrism right. was coming was coming around and stuff like that. I was like, oh, I could actually be myself and I could be African, which is also myself. There we go. Yeah. So everything. That's what's so important about that era of native tongues and what they oh did for all of us. Oh my god! Yeah. Like gave us a a sense of self uh, worth and mm-hmm. you know and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so by the time, so when Tribe came out, like, that's when I fell in love with hip hop. And then I was like, yo, I got to be a part of this somehow. And again, there was no internet. So I didn't know how, like what role I was going to play. Like, you know, I formed a group, the rap group and stuff like that. But you know, that was like short lived because you couldn't rap. Um, <laughs> you can rap. I can rap now. Okay. Not then. Not then. Okay. 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 Actually, I could, I can't really rap. I mean, I could rap now like, if, <laughs> if, if, if I really wanted to be a rapper. Okay. Right. Yeah, uh, let's be clear. Let's quantify that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um so yeah, so so Q-Tip became my hero. Mm-hmm. And you know, and then even more so once I found out his actual role besides being at the top of the pyramid, right. the leader, but you know when I found out making those beats. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um so yeah, so so he was my hero to this day. So when he said that and he confirmed when John coming back around when John confirmed that that was Q-tip on, on the phone and I'm, you know, I'm 15 years old. My head exploded. Right. And my heart exploded. And, and, uh, he was like, okay, so are you coming over? <gasps> yes. Th- that, th- what you just did, that's what I did in my head right. in my heart. Yeah. And then, so I was begging John, I said, yo, please have him come over like four 30 because I, I had school. Oh, I was right. in school. Like I cannot miss it. And and I knew I couldn't like I wasn't a skip to school kind of kid because like I was. Yeah. We know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Over there getting high and shit. <laughs> um yeah, you know, I like I wasn't gonna but you know, I mean I would have cut class right, if right, I had I to. But if you know, if if, we, if something could be worked out, mm-hmm. so I so I don't have to get an ass whooping. Mm-hmm. Um That would have been well worth the ass whooping. Though. Oh no, one thousand <laughs> percent. I would have took it. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah, so so, uh, so yeah, um, yo, I remember this Q-tip pulled up. He had the 325i, mm-hmm. the silver one. And I'm looking, I'm like, yo, my heart is racing. Like, hands getting all sweaty. I'm like, yo, I just got to remember that I got to be cool. I got to mm-hmm. be cool. And, um, yeah, I was cool. Like, I, I didn't ask him a million questions or whatever. And I, I don't think I was looking at him all crazy. <laughs> you look I'm crazy look, as you're thinking about it. Right. I, so I was looking at, I was looking at him crazy. Then I was looking at him crazy. Can right. I touch you? Yeah. <laughs> Word up. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So so um, so that was his first visit, and then um, he came over like two or three other times by mm-hmm. then, and then the third or fourth time he came over. By this time, you know, John, like he recognized my ear for it, and then I, you know, and he knew how badly I wanted to actually start making beats. And, you know, all right, let me pull it back a little bit. I remember, I want to say the third time Q-Tip came over, you know, by this time I was like, I mean, I, was, I wasn't like, yo, that's my man. That's mm-hmm. my guy, whatever. But I was like, all right, I could like, you know, kind of start asking him a few questions while he's digging and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I asked him, I said, man, you know, uh, like, how, how do you make beats? And he says, oh, get a sampler. And that's all he said. He said, get a sampler. He didn't say anything about sequencing, like what sampler to get. Mm-hmm. But, um, I was like, all right, cool. So John, so I told John, John went and bought uh, S950, uh, a Kai S950, just a sampler. We didn't know anything about sequencing and like putting it together or whatever. Yada, yada, yada. Long story short, eventually we upgraded to the Akai, I mean, to the Insonic ASR10 keyboard. Mm-hmm. And when I say we, I mean he right. upgraded me. Right. So, so, so he kept the equipment at his house, right. you know, because he spent like thousands of dollars mm-hmm. on this equipment and I'm just a kid. So by this time I was like around 16 years old and, um, <clears throat> you know, I got pretty good at looping samples. Like I wasn't like chopping beats or anything What's like that. What's the difference between looping and chopping? 
So when you loop a sample, you know, you're taking like a section of the sample and you ha- you're you kind of copying it uh, in uh, to it itself mm-hmm. and, and you do it for a, re- a repeated amount of time. When you're chopping it up, you're taking a section of a, of a recording and you take pieces of that section and you like rearrange it. Okay, mm. good. And you know, to, to, you know, really to manipulate the sound and, you know, to give it a different. In spin. your mind, that's more creative and more ownership, right? You know what? Than just a straight loop. Well, well, here's the thing. Like, I used to think that way. And I thought that way for so long, up until maybe about probably like seven or eight years ago. And because I thought that way, that actually stifled my career. Oh, that's interesting. Mm. That okay. stifled my career a lot. Mm. Um, Where you could have been making some ill loops. Man, I, yo, I could have been you, you on, started on. them like I could have been on, on like, uh, remember the... Right. Uh, Claudia, Claudia, Claudia Barry. Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I forgot you. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so that record, uh, Craig Kalman uh, told me about that record mm-hmm. and he wanted me to um, sample it mm-hmm. for his artist that he had on Big Beat. Um, Lil Kim right and I was a teenager at the time and so he told me about the record and then I think he gave the record to me because like so by this by that time like I was maybe like 17 like turning 18 there was like a little bit of buzz about me like mm-hmm. being this kid who knew about records and oh like he's starting to like he's making some beats that are cool so um, he had given me the record he's like yeah you know I want you to take this section and loop it and I was like, loop it. <laughs> I hit him with that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love this guy. I love action music. <laughs> he, he is amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and you know, and um, yeah, I was a kid. I was like, you know, and I felt like that was like beneath me to <laughs> to loop, to loop, and um, so so I tried to chop it up and stuff like that and it was coming out it was sounding worse and worse right. until I just never did it mm-hmm. and I never hit Craig back or whatever meanwhile that record eventually came out like like I think like four or five no like three or four hit records came out of oh, that, that one, one, record. one yeah. record a lot of bad boy yeah bad boy uh, I think Jermaine Dupri did yeah. something with it um and of course, all genres. Like I think L Cool J used it, and then like an R and B song, yeah. Jacket Edge or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I was like, every time I heard it, and it was a hit record. I was like, ah, oh, this guy's gonna fuck me up <laughs> if he ever saw me again. Right. So yeah, so I had the Insonic ASR10 keyboard. I was well, I was working on it, and you know I was getting pretty good at making beats. So Q and uh, Q Tip, he like he was scheduled to come by, so he walks through the door and he sees. Uh, I mean, and behind him is Large Professor. And this is my first time seeing Large Professor. I'm like, yo, right. this is this is really the house of hits. That's right. You know, um, so Large just walks in and he just starts freestyling to my beat. Wow. No introduction to me or anything like that. So, and he's like naming stuff around the room, and I'm just like, and I'm just thinking to myself, Pure like, MC. Yeah, straight up. And also one of the best producers of all time. There would be no Q to we wouldn't be having this conversation. Yeah. Without Large Professor. Yeah. And without what he did with with Main Source and all that. Or and it'd be Nas a rock album. Him. Yo, that's like, right. Yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. He doesn't um, get credit for that. N- not at all. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yo, you see his his his, his IG now where no. he does oh yo, oh, yeah. he he definitely he found a niche for himself like with his IG, but that's we talk about it. Okay. Um go to the Lost Professor's Instagram page. Yeah, so uh so he starts freestyling and you know, in his freestyle he called me 88 keys and it was in reference to like the ASR the ASR keyboard mm. sampler. And it's funny because a lot of people think that I play keyboards and mm-hmm. you know, for people who I who I've met, you know, once I became an actual producer and stuff like, "Oh man, yo, I know you wicked on the keys, man." Mm. I was like, mm, "Nope. Right. <laughs> I can sample some wicked keys." Right. Or whatever. Wasn't that a Dick Tracy villain too? Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, <laughs> and and you know it's funny. It's like a lot of people think I play keys because of Thieves in the Night. Mm. Thieves in the Night was that the first beat you sold? No, that that was actually the second beat okay. that I sold. What's the first beat you sold? The very first beat I sold, which is which uh, I believe is still it can still be found on iTunes, mm-hmm. uh, is um, is a remix I did for this group called uh, Network Reps. Okay, and my man. Our boy Matt Fingers. Shout out to Matt Fingers. Shout Matt out. Fingers was always good for a rap check. <laughs> yo, he, <laughs> yo, yes, <laughs> always good for a rap. Yes, check. Um, yo, he. You know what? He Matt Fingers is the ultimate plug. He was He's the plug, plug before. Like he, he was the polo plug. The polo. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Had, had his low, mom. Low connection. His mom. Yeah. yeah. Um, the polo plug. Like you know. Um, 
underground hip hop plug mm-hmm. and stuff. Like, uh, you know, I, I actually he was the plug for for Ye, for Kanye as well. Mm. But that's a that's I, crazy. We'll, we'll get to that. Damn, Matt Fingers. <laughs> um, I, I read an interview where you said that you knew that Black Star was going was 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 really about something when me and Yasin, who was called Most Deaf back then, took a cab from Brooklyn to your parents' Rich. house in Long Island. <laughs> Rich. Rich. Oh yeah, you know, you know. <laughs> he said we was balling. Yeah, yeah. No, it was it was incredible. Like that was incredible for, to wow. me. Wow. You know, uh, I, I think uh, I think I was 18 years old, still living. You were, you were, yeah. Yeah, 18, still living in uh, my parents' house, um, and you know, I had the studio equipment in the basement, and uh, you know, we were doing the song, uh, which became "Thieves in the Night," and I feel like it was in the winter time because it was like it was just seven o'clock, but it was I had a money with me. Yeah, he had his. It was like what two years old Something at the time. Like that, yeah. Yeah, so hey, Dad, good job. <laughs> yeah, Daddy duties. Um, so yeah, so 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 you guys showed up in the cab, and auto, like automatically, my mind was blown from like y'all came from Brooklyn in a cab to Long Island. And Most stuff like, had TV money. That's what it was. I was working uh, at the bookstore. I didn't have cab money, and that's fifty dollars in an Uber right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine right. what that was in the yellow in a cab. Mm. Yeah. So um, yes, and you know, and and then when you guys sh- <laughs> when you guys showed up, I was like, Yo, what's up, Quad? What's up, Most? Who that baby? <laughs> <laughs> who that baby? <laughs> who, 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 who my sister Mary, who uh, she she lived at home at the mm-hmm. time. Um, she took care of Amani, so mm-hmm. I was like, and yeah. Then we went downstairs and um, we created a classic. That's right. Um, um, break down how you changed Thieves in the Night from the four bar loop to the eight bar loop because originally we just wrapped in your basement to this four bar loop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which uh, which Yasin didn't like the beat, by the way. He didn't. He didn't. He he didn't get the vision until I, I laid it out. Yeah, because because uh, you explained to him. It's funny because all right, so 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 you laid down your verse. Yo, I'm remembering. See, I told you. This is crazy. It's crazy. It's like therapy. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor Talib quality yeah. therapy for Word. real niggas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, yeah. So so you laid your verse down, and then and then you explained how. Uh, I think you were inspired by Tony. Tony Morrison. Yeah, the, my verse. Uh, the the, the blue is the sort of hook of that song is taken from the last paragraph of the Bluest Eye by Tony Morrison. Rest in peace, mm-hmm. Tony Morrison. That's one of the best books I had ever read at, at, at that point in my life. So yeah, yeah. So so when you explained that to to Yasin, he was like he heard it, and you know, you, you, I'm sure you're familiar with that face when he's in deep thought. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly it. <laughs> And then he starts writing <laughs> and he's writing, he's writing. And then right. he lays down his verse on my four track, mm-hmm. um, my, my Fostex, Fostex four track. And, um, and his verse is long as hell. Mm-hmm. And so I'm automatically thinking like, all right, well, you know, when we get in the studio, uh, you know, we're going to cut his down to like a 16 or whatever. And, uh, and I remember that did not happen. Yeah, his yeah. verse is way longer than mine. Yeah, way, yeah, yeah, way longer. So, so yeah, so and, and because of that, I felt like you know his verse was so long. I felt like I had to do something with the beat. So it was uh, it was a four bar beat, um, which was chopped. Which I found out like a few years ago that, uh, that that beat made it to a list of some like, you know, official. Mm-hmm. I wonder. Yeah, I don't want to say the company name. Uh, official <laughs> list. Uh. I mean, I don't know if it's competition. No, but we, I, we, we have love for all the blogs and sites and uh, everybody here. Yeah, no, so I was, I was going to say, it's like, I, I don't know if it's like a complex list. I don't fuck with complex. Fuck oh, out. man. Like, <laughs> and it, and it, yeah, we're going to cut this section. Like, we're going to roll it back. We're going to roll it back. We're going to cut. Like, I don't know if uh, it's <laughs> complex. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, but no, no, like, like a few years ago, I found out like the, the, uh, the Thieves and Night made a list of, uh, of samples that people can't find. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, like, that's kind of, ridiculous it's, it's cool it's, mm-hmm. it's cool but it's kind of ridiculous because like i mean even though i chopped it but i i just didn't imagine that i would make a, a beat right. that would make a list i mean you started your career working in a place where large professor and q-tip were coming to dig crate dig at that's so, insane yeah yeah so that you know now it makes sense that's insane yeah <laughs> um all right so first of all I love. Do you guys remember the game DJ Hero? Did y'all ever play that? I, I'm a little old for that. Oh, yeah, I, I was. Felt, I was a little old for that. But too. I heard there was a game that people. Yeah, I felt DJ like I was a yeah. producer. <laughs> oh, <Shut> shit. <laughs> I used to kill it. <laughs> 
But anyway, for someone that is only made beats. Now you don't want to ask your question. <laughs> See what you did? Why not? You don't want to ask your question. I'm asking my yeah, question. Yeah, damn it. <laughs> I've only made beats in theory, but yeah. uh, so can you break it down exactly? Do you make like a whole song when you're making beats for someone, or do you send like certain portions of the songs out to people? Hmm. I'm glad you asked. Uh, my my methods for you know getting beats out to people have changed so much over the years and, and it's changed from observe due to observation due to uh, due to you know i guess failures uh frustration to the point where i now don't send people i don't send beats out to people oh. like, I, I actually i stopped shopping beats like tr the traditional sense of shopping beats back in 2010 <clears throat> because it, it just stopped making sense to me for me to for I mean, for several reasons, like me having to, I mean, and, and and not to say like I'm above or that I deserve to be in, you know, a place where I don't have to audition anymore. But I felt like I didn't have to audition anymore because if you're in like, and this is what makes sense in my head. Like if you're interested in getting music from me, that means you've heard something that I've already done. So if you like what you've heard and I'm only getting better, mm -hmm. like I'm, you know, like just logic would lead me. I feel like logic should lead somebody to believe like if they've had a tenure this long that, you know, they're doing something right. Mm. So it was like, why am I auditioning beats for you? If you know what I've done in the past and, you know, and you like that. So I could do something like that for you, if not better. Um, so it was that. And then I started to think about stuff where it's like, I remember one time, uh, Cuddy, Kid Cuddy reached out to me for beats. And this is after he became, <clears throat> you know, you know, the cult, you know, his has had his cult following. And uh, I was like, oh, yeah, no, nah, like he, he, he FaceTimed me. Or it wasn't even FaceTime, it was uh, iChat, video iChat on oh. my computer. So yeah, he reached out to me and I was like, oh yeah, no, nah, I got you, I got you. So I sent, I sent like 30 beats to him or whatever. And, uh, and then uh, he reached out to me again, like, hey, you know, you got any more stuff? I was like, yeah, yeah, I got you. So I sent some more beats and then I never heard back from him. Wow. And then in that moment, so that's when I thought, I was like, man, you know, he he didn't hear what he wanted to hear in that batch of beats, mm -hmm. which is only 30 beats. And then he didn't hear it in the, the next like 20 beats or 15 beats that I sent. So now he's looking at me like I'm the wrong guy for the job. Mm -hmm. I'm like, nah, I'm the right guy for the job. Mm -hmm. But you just only, you only heard this finite amount of beats i have hundreds of beats mm -hmm. wow already and i have thousands of more because i own twelve thousand records like vinyl records to sample from and you know my my ideas are always like fresh or whatever so that's when i decided it's like you know what i'm not shopping beats anymore because i'd rather not be considered than to be considered the wrong guy because wow. i'm never the wrong guy that's yeah. right you know it's like like i you know we just need to be under the same roof or you know, I need to like figure out, we need to just figure out how we're going to like make it work, but it's going, it would work and it'll work, you know, as long as you're not afraid to not have a song that sounds like a Drake song mm -hmm. or like, or anything that's popular on the radio, as long as you're not afraid of that and you trust, you actually trust your ears and you know like, oh, what we just made is actually sounds good, then we good. I'm never the wrong guy. That's never. How you I know. love that. Life. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, let's talk about um, working on Black on Both Sides, which is a classic hip hop album. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, you're one of the architects for that album. Yeah. Uh, you produced my favorite, one of my favorite most deaf songs of all time, Love. Oh, I didn't know that. I mean, I really love this song. It's a great song. No big pun intended. Yes, that's right. Um, you told a story once about <laughs> Speed Law. <laughs> oh, you get it. I got it. He got it. He's quick. He's quick. <laughs> um, <laughs> Speed in, in Law <laughs> was the, which you produced, great record, mm. was initially the single. Yes. And oh! <laughs> <laughs> Big shouts to Jerry. No, oh, let's go. Straight at Jerry. Jerry. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Ask. Ask me. <laughs> Ask me. Oh. I, I waited this 20 time. years for this moment. <laughs> I waited since 99 for this moment. Oh, yeah. I, yeah okay, so me. the story goes that Speed Law was the single for Black of Both Sides. The, 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 uh, the intended single. The intended right. single. <laughs> the Source magazine used to do this thing where they reviewed singles before they came out. <laughs> yep. The story is that... I'm sorry, right, man. Yes, you tell they, it. No, no, no. no. I, I just, okay. But they, they used to have other, like people of note 
right. reviewed as. Okay. So it wasn't like a source writer. It okay. was like a celebrity. But go ahead, oh, I, go ahead. I didn't know that. So who? So this so some celebrity reviewed Speed Law. Do you remember who it was? Uh, some what's his name? Uh, Jermaine Dupree. <laughs> <laughs> Killed my career. Do you, oh my Killed God. my career. Do you, do you remember what he said? I, yo, what did he say? I don't remember exact. I, I mean, I mentally blocked it out all these years. I just, <laughs> but I no, but I remember he <laughs> shitted on it. He, okay. def, he definitely. So now, at this it, was point, a, it was a little write up too, but you right. know, he was Jermaine Dupree. He's so. Jermaine Dupree. Now, Raucous was very uh, strategic. Me, I, I brought this up to Jared mm. to see if he remembers this. Um, he did not. <laughs> He did not remember this. Oh, why you over there? Why you red now, Jared? Why you red now? <laughs> he can't help why it. Why you red now? Face. You're making me smile. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what he did remember. Because what I said was, I said to him, I said, uh, Jared, uh, he said, I don't remember doing that, but it sounds like me, right? Uh, so I, I was like, I was like, because I, I skipped the part. Mm. The, that Speed Law never came out. Miss Fat Booty came out. Great As the first single, single yeah. Great single, mm -hmm. great record. Um, one of most biggest records. Mm -hmm. uh, because it was a single. <laughs> that's that's, that's a good point. Um, <laughs> but it makes, I didn't know the celebrity aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Ruckus was very strategic about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, it would, it makes sense that if Jermaine Dupree didn't like it, they would, they would move past that. But yeah. something that Jared said that was interesting to me is that for most deaf, he wasn't looking for a hit record. He was mm -hmm. looking for something he could market. Gotcha. Right. Which mm -hmm. is, there's a difference mm -hmm. with me. I said, you didn't give me that same consideration. <laughs> said, oh, no, no. He said, for you, I needed a hit record. I needed, <laughs> I needed a hit, definitely. Yeah. So we went in the studio, recorded uh, Reflection Eternal album, and you were there at Electric Lady, yes. which was a great creative environment uh, uh, incubator at that time. Yes. Common was working on like Water for Chocolate with Dilla, yep. who you also enjoyed a uh, great friendship with. Yep. Rest in peace to Jay Dilla. Yes. Um, the Roots and De uh, Amir and Pino Palladino mm -hmm. and James Poyser and then was working on a D'Angelo album, Voodoo, downstairs in the basement. <laughs> um, there's a studio that Jimi Hendrix built. Yep. Um, you were there every day. Gil Scott yep. Heron came in and did drops. You know what I'm saying? Dave I missed Chappelle. that. Huh? I, was, I was there for Dave, but I missed the, the Gil. Yeah. But here's what's interesting about the Gil Scott Heron drop. We made everybody who walked in that studio say, Talib Kweli, High Tech, Reflection Eternal. At the end of the blast, you hear Gil Scott Heron. At the beginning of the blast is these two young ladies who cannot pronounce my name. Oh, God. And they try to. You brought these women to the studio session. Yep. Who are these women and where are they now? <laughs> All right. So these two ladies, mm -hmm. um, Faith Costanza. Mm -hmm. and they didn't get any credit on this record. Wait, they're getting their credit now. Okay, okay. 20 years later. 20, 20 years kids. later. Faith, yeah, Faith, Faith Costanza. Costanza. I used to I used to call her bully because I saw an old photo of her mm -hmm. at her at her apartment one day and she just had this mean mug. She she's a, a, a I hope I I hope I get this right. I, I believe she's Italian with uh red hair. Beautiful uh young woman. Well, you know, we were all young back then. Um <laughs> And, no, 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 no. I mean, I like we're, we're, we're she's she really still, trying to get me to. No, 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 no. She's, no, no, she's still, no, no, she's still beautiful. She's still, she, nah, she's still a knockout. Right, right. You know, and and uh, and Jamie, I, I never knew Jamie's last name. Um, uh, Jamie, I believe she was uh, Italian or Irish and and Korean. Not mm -hmm. that it matters or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, like we black, love all people yeah, here yeah. at the People's Party. But yeah, um, so I met them when I was a teenager. Uh, I want to say like 16 years old. So at 16 years old, I was trying to bag chicks. And we're going back to the bag reference. Right. Um, That's why I felt like it was going to come up again. So yeah. I like, do people not know what bag means though? Like, I mean, we're in 2020 now. So it's like kids are saying some whole other, I'm sure. I have sure. no idea what the kids are saying. Yeah. Same. Um, <laughs> hashtag samesies. Um, <laughs> I guess you do. <laughs> Man, I got a TikTok account. Um, no. uh, yeah, so 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 I, I met them at the mall at Roosevelt Field Mall. Uh -huh. Hey, I used to work there. I was waiting for that. Uh -huh. I was, and Ro you know, it's not in Roosevelt. It's in Garden City. It's in Garden People City. People seem yeah. to think that it is, but it's not. Imagine if Roosevelt Field was actually in Roosevelt. People wouldn't go. People wouldn't go. <laughs> it would be shut down. I've been to Roosevelt it. Field Mall many times. I had no idea it wasn't in Roosevelt. I yeah, no, it's in Garden. Yeah, Garden been... City's the upper crust. Okay. It's like you know if you've been to Roosevelt. So yeah, you know, I, 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 I've been to the mall. Yeah. I mean, just look down on the floor. You see like... Hey, you know, hey, hey. Oh, hey. Okay. 
right. <laughs> let me take it. Let me reel it back a bit. Um, so yeah, so I met them at the mall. Uh, you know, tried to bag them up, but they were nice enough to like, you know, we, you know, yo, what's your page? What's your page number? What's your smart beep? Mm-hmm. Page number. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So um, you know, uh, they, they never gave me any play, but you know, we were all, we were good friends. I didn't get a lot of play at all. <laughs> just so you know, at, at all. But you know, it's cool. Yeah. Shout, it, shout out to. Shout out. Can't stand just. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So I brought him over, and then uh, they they you know it, so it was Jamie who butchered your name. Okay. Uh, uh, which you kept on the mm-hmm. record. Uh, uh, she said, uh, uh, Talib Shakui. Shakui. No, Shakui, yeah. I can't say it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Shout out to them. Now you um, you, it's interesting because you, Lars Professor. Mm. Q-tip. You're in the studio with me in high tech. Mm. You develop a relationship with Dilla. Mm. You're working with the best producers of all time at this point. Um, You met Kanye working at Baseline. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about meeting Kanye and how you develop such a close friendship because you're someone who is still around Kanye often to this day. I actually texted with him this morning. Okay. Um, Did you tell him he was coming here? uh, Nah, but you know, so no. (laughs) Bring him with you next time. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe I will. Yeah. Maybe I, well, I'll ask. Yeah. Don't just drag him. Don't just bag. Put him in a bag and bag him up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> drag him that, that, that's a different kind of bag. That's a different, like, ladies and gentlemen. That's a different kind of bag right there. You know. I mean, and you know where 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 we are in life and stuff. Like it, it's funny because uh, I I could probably you know I could probably say that I could still do that with him. Mm-hmm. Like, yo, let's go. Right. Yeah, was, that's what I'm saying. That's a unique position. There's not a lot of people who are like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but at the same time, I'm considerate enough to know that about, you know, his his lifestyle and, yeah. you know, so I won't be like, yo, let's go here. Right, right. And plus, I don't really want to go anymore anymore because I'm 43 and... <laughs> I don't want to go any place. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, um, so, yeah, so, uh, Baseline, you know, so Baseline Studios is more commonly known as, like, the Rockefeller Studio. Mm-hmm. Um, it was in Midtown Manhattan. I want to say... 27th street or whatever mm-hmm. um i actually wound up getting in with rockefeller and 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 the, the whole camp through just blaze mm-hmm. just, blaze. just blaze. blaze so yeah so so just got me in with the rock and oh because he was interested in the jane doe album that you were producing yeah where's jane doe at is she still in atlanta yeah i believe she's in okay. atlanta shout out to jane doe incredible mc yo she was so special and i I, I, I can't even say she was ahead of her time because no one to this day no one rocks like her. That's right. And like like and, and not just her pen game, but I don't know like so so when you all uh, worked or whatever, did, did you ever see her record or how she listens to music? I she recorded one one verse. <coughs> I, I saw her record. Oh yeah, she, that's right. She she came in and did the verse over. Yeah. So I remember <laughs> I was there the first time. I wasn't there the second time. Yo, she, and I don't like. I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure people noticed, but they probably didn't like internalize or whatever. But her her internal clock is ridiculous mm-hmm. so when the beat is like this and everyone's going like this she's rocking like this mm-hmm. but her timing on her words is just like you, you know she, and i think i feel like you know because of her internal clock like she just sound very special yeah. on these on these songs yeah. but anyway um so yeah I, I i wound up producing the majority of her what would have been her her debut album mm-hmm. and it was fire like like i actually i have it mm. so i'd like to hear that one day oh yeah Maybe you hear it to this today, um, <laughs> and yeah. So just just had a track on there, and uh, Havoc had a track on there, and uh, yeah. So um, so yeah. So that was my connection. That was my end with the, with the Rockefeller. So um, once I did um, watch it, bitches, Beanie Siegel by Beanie Siegel. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I got a little story to tell about that. Okay. So I made the beat. I chopped up uh, the uh, sample was from uh, this group called uh, Guilt. Uh, no, Hot was the name of this uh, group. And the song's called Guilty. So, you know, when I knew that I was going to go see, you know, Rockefeller, I was like, yo, I'm trying to make my hardest beats and stuff like that, blah, blah, mm-hmm. blah. And that beat came out. That, that was like the hardest beat I ever made in my life, probably, mm-hmm. at the time. So uh, I went I went to shop beats mm-hmm. at... Def Jam, back when Def Jam was on 50th or whatever. <clears throat> um, you know, passed out some CDs or whatever. No, I, I, I left the CD over there mm-hmm. and then I had one more CD on me. And so as I'm walking out of Def Jam, Jay-Z's walking in. Wow. And this is the this is my second encounter with him. But 10 years went by between my mm-hmm. like the first time I saw him uh, in the studio or whatever. And he was, of course, he wasn't like Jay-Z mm-hmm. back then. I mean, he was Jay-Z, but he wasn't 
He was Hawaiian Sophie. Right. Yeah. Hawaiian Sophie. The nigga on the boat? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, so I so I stepped to him and, you know, he's walking in the building. I was like, hey, what's up? You know, I said, I'm a producer. I said, we actually met like years ago. He said, oh, cool, cool. And he had like a very small entourage with him, mm-hmm. whatever. I said, yo, um, this is CD. I got some beats on here. If you, know, you want to check them out, I have my, my number on it and stuff like that. He goes, so he, so I put the seat like, I put the seat in his hand. He looks at it. He goes, "Oh, no, just send this to my office." And 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 he gives it back to me. I said, like, "All right, cool." And then he walks in. I said, like, "Wait a minute. Where's his office?" <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what and at that he moment He pulled the Jedi mind trick. Yeah. yeah. And then that moment. This is not the droid you're looking for. <laughs> 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 I am not the Jay Z that you. Yo, yes, yeah. straight up. And, Another and, Star Wars reference. Yeah, and, and, and I, I realized that yo, he just played me. <laughs> I I just got played by Jay Z. Right. Um, you know, so it's a good problem to have. Yeah, yeah. So, but 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 oddly enough, I was you know I found out uh, that's the same day I was I was I'm, I'm, I was on my way to baseline. Mm-hmm. So that night, I go to baseline. So I I had the CD on me. Um. I play the CD, uh, you know, people like, you know, they, everyone's fucking with the beats on there, like, you know, Young Guru's there mm-hmm. and everything. Shout out to Young Guru. Yeah, shout, shout out to Young Guru. Very integral part of many stories up yeah. there at People's Party. Oh, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so Beans, like in, like, in the middle of me playing my beat CD, Beans walks in with Philadelphia. Like, it was like, a good 12, like a dozen like all, people. All of Philadelphia. All of Philadelphia, <laughs> like South Street, just, mm-hmm. just walked in the door. <laughs> so, you know, he's like, yo, bring it back, bring it back. So we're playing this stuff and we're playing the song. I mean, we're, we're, we're playing my beat CD again and then he hears that beat, you know, and everyone is like, he sh- shuts it down. Like everyone's, yo, this is crazy, this is crazy. Then he just starts freestyling. Or oh, I, I, I could have swore it was like, um, that he had a rhyme, mm-hmm. and but he's like going off the top, and mm-hmm. I was like, "Yo, this is crazy!" And uh, Goo was like, "Yeah, he's freestyling." So he's like, "Yo, you go in the booth and start recording." He's like, "Yo," goes in the booth, he records the whole song, like almost. Wow. I, I feel like I mean, it was just a couple of takes. He mm-hmm. records the whole song, and I'm thinking, and his song is about like you know B I T C H's and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And I'm thinking, well, I made this song to like kind of like you know you're guilty and you know drug deal going wrong and mm-hmm. blah blah blah. And he's talking about like so I'm totally different. Yeah, totally yeah. different. But I was like, hey, they like it. It's cool with me. It's whatever, whatever. So later on, uh, Jay comes in, and I just, same day that I put. Mm-hmm. So he he sees me in there. He hears the song, and he's like, "Yo, who did this?" And you know, they point to me, mm-hmm. and he looks at me and he goes, Yo, "Come here for a second. Uh-huh. <laughs> so he he talks to me. He, so he puts his arm around me. Mm-hmm. And he walks me out the room, then he puts me in a headlock. He's like, yo, he's like, man, yo, why didn't you get back to me? <laughs> Jay was trying to bully the beat out of you. Yeah. I was like, I, and I told him, I looked, I looked at him, I said, yo, I put the CD in your hand. Right. <laughs> in your hand. In, like literally in your hand. Right. And then he's like, I, you know, he, he kind of chuckled and he kind of walked away. That's hilarious. Yeah. Well, I just want to commend you for spelling out, bitch. Like that was just like made me feel. Oh, so I don't, yeah, I don't, that I don't use know. that word. I should have done the same thing, but whatever. I, 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 no, no, no. I mean, like, no, to, to, to you know, to each their own and stuff. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't use that word. I don't say the P word and mm. I don't say the N word anymore. The P U S. Yeah, P U S. Yeah. How woke and intersectional of you. <laughs> Good job, I mean, idiot keys. You, you know, it just, uh, it just never. You know what? I, I was never the 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 dude who participated in locker room talk. Right, mm. but you don't drink or smoke or any yeah. of that as wow. well. Like you're yeah. good, clean, and wholesome. Yeah, you know, I except mean, for a couple of vices. Yeah, I got my <laughs> vices. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. Uh, but oh. yeah, Kanye. Oh, so back. So to he was at baseline. Yeah, he's, he's, so he's at baseline um, one day, um, and for some reason, like baseline was closing. It was shutting down a little early. I guess uh, I don't know. People probably had events mm-hmm. to go to or whatever, and it was like around eight ish or so. And I meet him, and you know, uh, I told him who I was. Like we introduced ourselves, and I told him he who knew I was. your work, though, right? He yeah, no, he like when I told him who I was, yeah. he was like, "Oh, oh you're Eddie Keys." Like, no, he's like, "Oh, yeah, that's what your name represented for that type of underground hip hop that Kanye was trying to break into at that time." Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, you know, and then he was telling me how you know, and for a long time, I always thought, like, I I guess I remembered our conversation like slightly wrong because I always thought he said that like. Pardon me. That um, Black on Both Sides was his favorite album, mm-hmm. but it was actually one of his close friends at the time, okay. um, uh, Sakaya. Mm-hmm. It was like his child, you know, his uh, 
childhood friend. It was his best album. His, I mean, his favorite mm-hmm. album. So he, so he's like, yeah, you know. Um, and then he was telling me like stuff that he made, and and he had he had stuff to his credit. Beanie but, Siegel stuff, <clears throat> J, uh, Jermaine Dupri stuff. Yeah, uh, but D-Dot Angeletti. Yeah, but but the so so the Beanie Siegel thing is is when we is where we stopped. But you know, so he's naming like he's like your Foxy Brown stuff, mm-hmm. and so he's naming stuff from artists that I was familiar with. But I was part of. I was part of like that backpack divide. Right. So even though I knew who Foxy Brown was, and sh- you know, and you didn't of course, know his album cuts. I didn't know the album cuts because yeah. I was never into Foxy Brown like that. Like, like she could spit, right? But you know, she's flossy, right? Right. She's That's not what she was doing. Right. Yeah. So like, nah, you know, um, I'm, you know, I, I would listen to Rockets records. Mm-hmm. Shots. <laughs> um, yeah. So you know, so 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 he's naming these artists of, you know, and he's naming artists that you know I didn't, I never heard their full albums, and you know. But then I, I told him, I said, but I said, yo, your, your name sounds familiar. And I said, you know, I told him, I said, I always thought your name was like Cayenne. <laughs> um, so, so, so then when he mentioned Beanie Siegel, the truth, mm-hmm. which is like, my, that's the first beat I heard from him. That's the one that made me be like, I need some of them beats. Oh, see, yeah. so, so, Beanie so Siegel, he, the truth. Yeah. So he named everybody else. And then he, then when he said, then when he said that, I was like, yo, I said, you did that? He's that's like, right. yeah. And I was like, yo, that's that song. I said, yo, that song and stop chill, which, um, uh, Rockwilder did. I said, those are my two favorite songs on the album. And he goes, yeah, that's me. And then he goes, um, I said, oh, you know, you know, dapping him, dapping him up, I'm giving him his props and stuff. He goes, yeah, you know, but I'm, I'm finna be a star. <laughs> I was like, I said, what? Right, well, what? Yeah. And he's like, yo, I'm, I'm, I'm finna be a star. <laughs> and I just looked at him. I looked at him and I just blinked. I was like, like no, 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 and, and and by so by the second time he said that and my reaction because like I literally didn't know what he was talking about mm-hmm. what he said and then he goes I'm going to be a star like mm-hmm. that I said oh I said why he said oh because I rap too mm-hmm. I said all right cool I said yo let me hear something so you know he says rap and the rap was kind of cool but you know it, I mean it, it, was, it was cool but it was like regular it was like oh mm-hmm. you know he got punchlines here and there whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at that time I had like three raps in my catalog cause right. I was never trying to be a rapper back then, but you know, just the, the fair exchange. And then he just kept going. I was like, Oh, okay. I was like, Oh yeah, you can rap, you know, give him his props. Mm-hmm. And when he told me that, um, at that moment, like I didn't have any reason to doubt that he was going to be a star, right. but so I'm thinking like, yeah, yeah, he's going to, you know, he'll probably get a record deal. Mm-hmm. You know, he probably make some noise or whatever. Hopefully I get some beats on there or whatever, but he, he, he saw it all. Mm-hmm. So, uh, studio was shutting down. And we're all going home. At the time, you know, I lived in Newark, New Jersey. That's mm-hmm. where I went when I got kicked out of my home mm-hmm. uh, from Long Island. So I to lived Newark? in Newark. Yeah, yeah Newark is where artists go when they get in the music industry, and you get enough success where you have name recognition, but you're not successful enough to live in New York. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you have to go to Newark. But yeah. Newark is like it's not the nicest place to live. Like, yeah, it could I be mean, messed up, but, but for you know, seven hundred dollars for a spacious two bedroom yeah, apartment floor. Shout out to Do It All. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> for real, he's like ran for city council in Newark. Right. You know, shout out to Mayor Rasparaka, who's the homie, the mayor of Newark. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Cory Booker. Try to Cory Booker. Oh, that's right. That's the, only, that's the only one I know. Right? Cory Booker. Yeah. Cory Booker beat Rasparaka, mm. became the mayor, then then became a senator, and mm. when he became a senator, Rasparaka became the mayor. Oh, okay. But yeah, keep going. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> so yeah, so, uh, you know, we're in 20... 20- I believe it was again 27th Street and like 7th Avenue. So like I'm walking. So you know we're walking together. We walk out together. We take the elevator and you know we're chopping it up, or whatever. And so we're walking, and I'm going towards uh, Penn Station to get mm-hmm. home. And you know, and he's walking with me. And so I'm thinking like you know, and I don't want like he wasn't like talking my ear mm-hmm. off or whatever. But but you know he's asking me these questions and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And you know, then we I walk into Penn Station and I'm walking downstairs and he's like kind of fo- I'm thinking he's following me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And so, but I'm thinking like, yo, he probably lives in Queens or in Brooklyn mm-hmm. or whatever. So he's going to take the A or, you know, whatever. So, so we walk down and then we walk up. Yeah, I'm walking up towards uh, the the uh, the New Jersey Transit. Mm-hmm. And he's following me still. And, and, and by that time, I was like, all right, you got to go this way. Because right. like the E, the E and C right. is right there. Right. And then you go that little path to get to the A. Right. And so I'm thinking, so by this time, I'm like, yo, is he following me? And, uh. I was like, yo, um, where you going? Like, where, 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 where are you going? Yeah. I, know, I know where I'm going. <laughs> but in, in my mind, the question really came out like, yo, where do you think you're going? Yeah, right. um, you know, so I, I said, where are you going? He goes, uh, uh, I live in Newark. 
I said, oh, that's crazy. I said, I live in Newark too. And he said, oh, where? Are they? Like, I just moved in and stuff like that. Yeah, so I remember I that like, crib. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, at the Renaissance was building. always on, on the couch. Which came, like, I introduced them. Okay, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was. Yeah, by that time I was going over there, it was always consequence on the couch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, so he was, and and in all honesty, like, like I, I was I was like, yo, that's cool that you live there, but he was hyped about it. Mm-hmm. So he was hyped that we both lived in Newark. And then he was like, "Yo, man, yo, yo, we should, we should uh, link up. We should, you know, we should hang out." I said, like, oh, "Yeah, cool. I mean, he was in, he was, he had come to New York to make his name in the business, mm-hmm. like in Newark. That probably to know that he's living in the same city as 88 Keys and have access to you, mm-hmm. yeah. pro- probably a beautiful thing for him." Yeah, and it, it actually it became a beautiful thing, and and I mean, but I didn't see this coming. So, um, so I said, like, "Yeah, you know, you know, come to my come to my my spot or whatever." And, uh, you know, come through like around, you know, tw- at noon or whatever, whatever. And, you know, we hang out and, you know, you know whatever. So, <clears throat> Ye came over like around like noon or one. And I'm thinking like we're going to do the whole like producer thing. Mm-hmm. So, I showed him my studio. You know, I welcome him in, show him my studio. You know, I play some beats and stuff. Like, he going, you know, he's rapping and stuff. Like, we do that. And then, um, you know, so he goes into my living room. He sees my DVD collection, mm-hmm. which used to be a thing. And he's like, oh, yeah, you know, I got that, I got that, I got that. And, you know, he's talk, we talking about movies and stuff. And then he sees my PlayStation, and then we start playing PlayStation. So I'm thinking, like, we just going to hang out for, like, a couple of hours. Mm-hmm. Then, you know, he showed up, like, around noon or 1. He didn't leave till like, 2 in the morning. Wow. And But the whole time, like, he, like just interacting with him was so fun. And, you know, this dude is hilarious. So at the end of the, at the, but the, end of the night, he's like, yo, you should come to, to my spot. And you know, check my stuff out. I was like, all right, cool. Went to his spot the next day. Same thing happens. Mm-hmm. And I'm there all day. Mm-hmm. So from those two days to about like, I want to say damn near till his album came out. So like, like so like for four years straight, we're with each other, probably like five to eight hours a day, wow. five days a week for four years straight. Mm-hmm. Like going on missions, trying you know bag chicks. Together. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of bagging, a lot of bagging of the chicks. A lot of bagging, <laughs> a lot of bagging of the chicks. <laughs> no, 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 no. A lot of attempts of bagging yeah, of the chicks. A lot of attempts. A lot of attempts. Um, yeah. So, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so we we became best friends. But you know, back then, like you know, we wouldn't say, "Oh, this is my best friend." Like, mm-hmm. but um, so uh, I want to say like a month went by of us, like the first month. You know, uh, he tells me that his mom's coming through, is uh, paying him a visit, mm-hmm. and you know, rest in peace, of Don West. Rest in peace. Um, and uh, you know, that I should come by and meet her. I was like, all right, cool, yeah, I'll meet your mom and stuff. So came through, and you know, uh, met her, met his mother, and you know, she was very like warm and welcoming and stuff like that. And then, then when I found out she was a doctor, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm impressed. And so, right. So he was raised to be impressed by the mm-hmm. doctors. Exactly. He was raised <laughs> to be a doctor. Right. <laughs> exactly. And that didn't work out. <laughs> um, so, so that afternoon, uh, meeting his mom and, you know, Ye went into his room. I think he was starting to work on some music or whatever. So she sat me down at the table and she's like, you know, she looked me dead in my eye and she tells me how appreciative of me. Mm. Wow. And she said, she said, oh, I speak to Kanye every day, mm-hmm. every night. And he always talks about you. He talks about this friend that he made out here in New York. You know, I mean, we were in, in Newark and stuff like that. Um, that he made this this real friend in New York and that you really look out for him and you really try to take care of him and stuff like that. And she said, I want you to know that, you know, I appreciate you for that and you're family now. Oh. That's beautiful. And, uh, and yeah, and, and, and I've never, I, I didn't, I never had a conversation like that with my mother. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I, I didn't even know how to, so I was, I mean, by, by this time I was an adult, I was well, 20 mm-hmm. or whatever. And uh, I was like, oh, thanks. And, you know, but I didn't, like, I, I, I knew what, it was, but yeah. I didn't really fully internalize it. Yeah, you know, because I'm just like, yo, that's yay, right? Mm-hmm. You know, um, that friendship led to you know some great music, notably uh, "No Church in the Wild." Oh yeah, yeah, which yeah. is one of Kanye's and Jay Z's greatest songs. Congratulations yeah. on that song, by the way. Oh man, appreciate it. Um, yeah. Kanye, not to get too much into the politic, because I know that Kanye has to be responsible for his own statements and mm-hmm. wild controversial stuff mm-hmm. um but speak to me as someone who's his friend who has to who, who has made the choice to as his friend stick by him mm-hmm. when a lot of people just won't because of the things he says that they feel like are harmful to black communities or oh. to marginalized <clears throat> communities yeah um i i feel it's because people really don't know him mm-hmm. um and uh 
they don't know where his heart is mm-hmm. or or they they seem to not they seem to not be able to look into his heart mm-hmm. okay and i know cuz you know as as much as people say he's changed and stuff like that he's actually been the same dude since day 1 mm-hmm. with the exception of his newfound or his strengthened faith mm-hmm. and his cuz he's always been a christian and stuff but now he just yeah, he's, he's taking it from a different. He's giving us a fresh perspective. Yeah, on his version of Christianity. Yeah, that's the but, way but, that I will say it. Yeah, but but he, he he's been the same dude since day one, mm-hmm. and uh, you know just having kind, con- you know, us having conversations, and you know him having conversations with and you know person who's interviewing him is a completely mm-hmm. different. It's it's different yet it's the same. Like he has the same passion and ideas, but you know I feel like I feel like uh, just under the gun mm-hmm. um you know he thinks extremely fast and he thinks extremely forward mm-hmm. and i think you know it's uh challenging sometimes for both sides involved to know mm-hmm. what he's what he's looking to say and what he's actually like hearing what he's actually saying and then trying to decipher it from a person who one is coming in is looking at him already with a perspective that's not favorable mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. you know and then and also the way you know when they're viewing him they're viewing him as money and this lifestyle mm-hmm. this, you know that he's earned himself mm-hmm. um but they don't know his actual i feel like his actual intentions mm-hmm. are um are kind of like left yeah, I, I agree with you completely. Um, something I've said on this show before, something I've heard on the internet, when it comes to oppression, intentions don't matter. Only results do. Yeah. Um, but when you have a respect for someone, you consider their their intentions. When you have a mm-hmm. relationship, you yeah. consider it. And I think that's why I think it's fair for people to have the criticisms that they have of Kanye mm-hmm. to not give a fuck about his intentions. Yeah. Because... Me personally, as someone who has the same amount of love for him as, as you have, like we, we we knew him at the same, met him at the same time. So I love the brother to death. Mm-hmm. But I do feel like I agree with you about his intentions. Mm-hmm. But I feel like when you're talking about marginalized people, we can't count that, mm-hmm. you know. But I think you and me can count that, yeah. which is why I'm not. I'll, I'll never be like fuck Kanye ever. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Because I understand. But for marginalized people who his comments can sometimes harm, I get why people be like, whether his intentions are good or not, that doesn't matter. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then and then also also uh, and I, and uh, just in this moment, I just thought about this uh, taking into consideration that you know people who know him and people who have access to him, they have they're able to continue dialogue. So the dialogue yeah. is continuous. It's back and forth as opposed to just yeah. And so as opposed to like okay, uh, you're like we could schedule or you know you can have Kanye sit down with you at this moment mm-hmm. for an hour and then. He, He's out, and then now his words are left there, mm-hmm. and you don't know about his growth, right. and that you know maybe you know so, so maybe some of the things that he said would be retracted if you could get those if you could hear him say right. it. But when you are, when you have something in the media, they're not giving you the chance to do that because that's not going to be the big story. That's not going to be what's interesting right. to see. Yeah. Well, I mean, with great he, power <laughs> comes great responsibility. He has a great power, powerful platform that he worked hard to earn to get. I mean, but but even even that, uh, you know, like even outside of it being clickbait, it's just the the logistics of it that you can't talk to him every single day mm-hmm. or or you know or or even even if you do like you know it's it's like uh it's like updating software mm, that's if, an interesting analogy yeah it's like yeah. updating software and he's like he's this Kanye 5.0 yeah you know what I'm saying but yeah, maybe people try to just hate on him too like oh that's not that's not I mean gospel. I do think that's not this I and do I'm think like, there there are just valid criticism there I do okay. think there's valid when you're when you're dealing with spirituality. Mm. And you're 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 linking up with people like Joel Osteen and certain other people. There's things that he's doing that go into the space of that is a valid criticism that maybe you don't understand the forces that you're dealing with. Mm-hmm. I like what Eight was saying. I believe that Kanye has the best of intentions in the whole world, but you got to be careful when you're that powerful. Mm-hmm. Con, when Kanye says I'm an icon and I'm a genius and everybody should be paying attention to me, mm-hmm. and every, he's right. Mm-hmm. He's right. Yeah. But being that you're right about that, then you gotta weigh your words and understand the power of what you're saying. Mm. You know, understand that when you say that I'm gonna now, you know, do don't don't call me secular, that's a powerful statement. When you when you take your powerful 
your your who you are stand next to Candace Owens, stand next to Donald Trump, stand to next to those things. Obviously. You know, uh, uh, Joe Osteen. That opens you, you up for for valid criticism. People be like, you're not really understanding the power of what you're doing. I, I feel like I, I feel like uh, I mean, and I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm no strategist mm -hmm. and you know I haven't had these conversations with him or something mm -hmm. like, but me knowing him and knowing his intentions I feel like it could be if I had to if I had to like really look at it from from what I feel for myself as a logistical mm -hmm. standpoint is like he's kind of uh, using these people as a conduit as a megaphone mm -hmm. to you know get his actual message out so it's like you know I mean and not trolling mm -hmm. but I guess Whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's like, okay, I'm gonna stand next to the person who's the most viewed person on Yeah, I, I think he's trying to be strategic and I think that he's used to winning. Yeah. And so far his his strategy, he's been forward thinking and strategy has always paid off. Mm -hmm. And I think that whether or not this is going to pay off, it seems like it's not in certain ways. Yeah. But I think that that's what the new part about it is. He's not used to doing things that didn't quite work out. Yeah. And it's the first time with the Trump and the Candace Owens thing. But at the same time, mm -hmm. you know, him looking to be a rapper and be that didn't work out either. No, at, I think it did though. No, it, it, yeah. it eventually. But that's, it did. that's what I think. This, I think that's what it is. So many times in his life, mm. people have told him no. Yeah, I told him you were wrong, and they were wrong. Yeah, and it worked out. Yeah. So I think that's where he's at with this. Yeah. Mm. At, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So 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 I would say with that with that being said, it's like give him time to yeah f fall, fail, make his mistakes, learn from them, and then become the superpower that you're 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 a great friend because that's what you're supposed to do and you're supposed yeah. to push your friends to be great mm -hmm. and greater and when and when they go in through these moments these valleys and these peaks yeah. you're supposed to hold them down no matter what yeah, you don't yeah. Need them. and you know and you know but like, keep it real with them and be honest with them oh yeah 100 yeah. percent. like and it's funny because the 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 first the first time where um he actually asked me how i felt about something that was that became a public, mm -hmm. you know, spectacle or whatever was the MTV thing with mm -hmm. the, the, the and, Taylor Swift thing. Yeah, because I went uh, to his house that night. <laughs> yeah, 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 That's yeah. I wasn't. Yeah, I didn't moment. go there that night. Yeah. Um, so when he asked me about it and just the tone in his voice when he asked, he's like, "So, so what do you think about?" Because mm, he respected your view. Yeah, and, that, and, and and that's that's when I that's when I knew like he views me differently from yeah. a lot of other people. No, I'll was, give it to him straight as well. That's right. Mm -hmm. He executive produced Death of Adam, which is your yeah, solo yeah, yeah. album. Um, I read an interview where some the interviewer asked you, "What is the album about?" And you said, "This album's about vagina, a woman's vagina." I thought that was obvious. <laughs> That's what you yeah, said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much, pretty much. I mean, you know, so um, <laughs> you and Kanye bagging chicks. Yeah, you know, it's about bagging vagina. <laughs> no, nah, but d d to be honest, like in all honesty, my my intention of the album, mm -hmm. like I was trying to. I was like with me giving that as my response, like like in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. That's on, on very topical. That's what it was about, mm -hmm. um, and I was also trying to be. Uh, excuse me. Um, I don't know if, it, if it, elusive is the right word that I'm looking for, but I was, you know, just trying to like reel people in, like, right. hey, find out what, find out for yourself. I'm selling vagina, y'all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> vagina for sale. Selling vagina. It Not sells selling. itself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't even have to say nothing. I just be like. Vagina. vagina. Buy it. Sale. You know what it is. Exactly. You know, the, the oldest profession. <laughs> um, okay. That's, that's a good strategy, Joe. Like, what, so what's your album about? You, do you like pussy? Yeah. Vagina, Tyler. I'm sorry. Vagina. I'm just, I'm facetious. Yeah. No, so, so but but my, my actual intention for the album was, um, so... I, I So I got married mm -hmm. uh, at, in 2006. Then, uh, you know... Um, had our first my my daughter uh, shortly thereafter mm -hmm. um living in harlem at the time and walking around with uh, my wife well my my then wife mm -hmm. and um shout out to krista shout out to krista yeah she's a uh, awesome woman great woman uh extremely smart mm -hmm. graduated at nyu magnum cum laude, uh, summa cum laude she be killing her on instagram yeah yes she does <laughs> she does you know self-taught photographer and mm -hmm. self uh, mother of my children uh you know we had 12 great years um, i thought you were about to say 12 great children i was like Yeesh. oh I, man I, yeah it's a powerful vagina yeah <laughs> <laughs> no wonder you made this <laughs> no no but but you know so 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 in, in, in all honesty so um you know just just walking through uh walking through Harlem mm -hmm. and, ha you know, having our baby in the stroller and stuff and people noticing our baby and, you know, just like, 
you know, we got a lot of attention from Chloe. Uh, you know, just oh, she's beautiful. Like, mm-hmm. oh my God, like you guys are so lucky. Da da da. Um, my, my wife, she's uh, uh my my um, the, the mother of my children, she's uh white, and you know we have a mixed race baby. Mm-hmm. You know, black and white. Um, That's mixed race. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. African American. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 We'll take it. Yeah. We need the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so you know um. So we would, we would all often get uh, compliments on how beautiful our child is, and then the second thing was like they would notice our wedding bands, mm-hmm. um, which I'm no longer wearing. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, they would notice our wedding bands and be like, oh wait, you guys are married, mm-hmm. and I just found it so bizarre that mm. people would like it was normal for us to have a baby, but not be married, but not be married, right? And I was like, oh, that has to be addressed, like mm-hmm. you know. Um, just in the community that you know of you know my my community which is like i see is like hip-hop community or you know so so to be honest i was trying to in my tongue-in-cheek way i was trying to promote marriage or just you know fathers you know if you know to trying to encourage relationships that's going to be uh a union you know Mm -hmm. the more traditional union Mm -hmm. i mean you know if it it works out for people and you know or and or be careful you know well i shouldn't say be careful but choose your mate wisely wisely that's a word yeah and um yeah so so that's what i was that's that's the tale that's being told in my album, like right. uh, tongue in cheek. And that's what I was really trying to promote and trying to push. But I was trying to do it in a way like, oh, this album's about vagina. Like, right. hey. <laughs> I, I, get yeah. I get it. I get it. He was like, this album's about vagina, so get married? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although you don't have to marry vagina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I noticed uh, that you have on all polo, as yes. usual. You've Pretty been wearing usual. all polo head to toe. Rooted to the Tudor, underwear, socks, everything. Mm-hmm. Oh, For, you want to see? No, I don't. No, no. Um, well, he's trying for, to get in trouble here. Uh, Steve Faramucci uh, works with us. He's fascinated by this. Yeah. And it's funny. It's, it's, to me, it's funny that he's fascinated by it. Yeah. Because I grew up in Brooklyn. Yeah. Well, I grew up in Brooklyn. I remember I went to uh, some sort of uh, outlet mall in Pennsylvania. You drive to get the clothes before school. You get the, the outlet malls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm trying right? to remember which mall. I, I don't remember which one yeah. it was. I got a polo goose with oh. the ski man shit right mm-hmm. i got to so brooklyn i had this shit for a month before somebody punched me in my face and tried to take it from me oh. now wearing polo was dangerous in brooklyn mm-hmm. because it was a status symbol the low lives came out of that mm-hmm. shout out to vic low aka yep. thurston the howard, howard the who recently was a model in the polo app you know what i'm saying make some noise for thurston how yes because these, time coming. they kicked in the door they used to Let, run in the no, polo literally, mansion and literally. kick in the fucking yeah, you kick door. In the door. You know what I'm saying? And steal all the polo out the store. Macy's Polo Mansion, Bloomingdale's. No. Wait, they used to steal it or oh, buy they just, it? Yeah, oh, okay. it was called boosting. Boosting. Yo, yo, yeah, I, I, they I heard started that. Called. That's yeah, yo, no, no. I, I heard, I heard that they invented those tags because of them. That's, like, a, that's absolutely but, correct. Oh wow! But so I, I say this to say that we're in polo with some gangster street Brooklyn shit. Yeah. You weren't living that lifestyle. Absolutely not. So at what point in your life did you decide to just dress like a low life for the rest of your life? <laughs> well, <laughs> I feel, well, all right, so, mm-hmm. all right. And, and so in 10th grade, when, mm-hmm. uh, so I, I moved to Long Island, I want to say either 90 or 91. Um, I, I made, I got really good grades. Mm-hmm. So every time I, you know, got good grades, my brother uh, would, you know, splurge on me on, on, on clothes, uh, mm-hmm. for school clothes. What? So. Yeah. We got nothing for good grades. Oh no, yeah, my my brother, like my brother, he's actually a doctor, like with an extremely successful practice, and his wife's a doctor. They got monies. Um, <laughs> yeah, my my brother. My brother's a lawyer. Shout out to brothers who do better than you. Yeah, when you're an artist. <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. Social worker and a stripper. <laughs> At the same time. <laughs> she okay. She's a social worker. Oh, she does pole sense. dancing. That actually she doesn't really strip. Right. She doesn't really strip. She's a pole dancer and she's a social worker. She keeps her clothes on. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it still makes sense. Like yeah. you know, because they're doing social work. <laughs> social work and social media and yeah. the IG models. Networking. Yeah. Shout um, out to you. Sorry. Love you. So. uh Trying to keep up with the Joneses or trying to be cool and mm-hmm. stuff like that in um, in ninety or ninety one or whatever, um, you know, I used to, I went to Roosevelt Field Mall, like you know. So when you first walk in and you go to the men's section, there was Gant and all mm-hmm. that stuff. Like I ain't doing Izod and Gant, like mm-hmm. Izod, Chaps, <laughs> fuck out of here, Chaps. Yeah, shout out to Chaps. Now, um, and then uh, uh, Nordica was right here. Um, guess I never did any of the guest tops. I used to buy the Urban Cut 
Chaps, you know what Chaps stands for, right? Nah. Could have had a polo shirt. No, it doesn't. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I thought you made a chap chap. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I remember wait. That. I remember that. Shout out yeah. to DJ Chaps from Long Island. Yep. Hey, yeah. Strong Island. Yep. So, yeah, so so I, I would buy, I would buy, like, you know, I would st- make these pit stops at, you know, uh, Nordica. And uh, I think Hill Figure was just coming out at the time, mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, I guess I always bought the guests, uh, the urban cut jeans or whatever, because, like, tapered wasn't a thing that was mm-hmm. cool back then. And then the last stop was uh, Ralph Lauren, uh, mm-hmm. the Ralph Lauren store. And then, so in all the other pit stops I made, I would spend like, you know, maybe like 10 minutes trying to find something that I liked. Mm-hmm. And I would just buy it, you know, because, uh, you know, like I would eventually find something that, that, that looked okay. Mm-hmm. And then by the time I got to the Ralph Lauren store, I liked everything in there. Mm-hmm. And so it took it took my dumb ass like about a month or two to realize like, oh, why don't I just like, bypass all the other stores and mm-hmm. go straight to the mm-hmm. Ralph Lauren store because then I have more money to buy more Ralph. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so then I started doing that. But, you know, the pants, you know, again, tapered. Not mm-hmm. doing that in the 90s. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so my bottoms will always be guest urban cut jeans. Right. I wore the jeans t- was, just, was the ones. Yeah. And then, you know, I couldn't afford the Jabos. Mm-hmm. Um, Jabos was, yeah, you had to go to the village. You had to, and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had the Jabos with the snaps at the bottom. I never had your yeah. so, I never yeah. had polo or I don't wear name brands. Crickets. <laughs> um, Same old low sweater. Yeah, so like, uh, <laughs> as I was saying, as I was saying, loser. Uh, she can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, so I was. Did you wearing, see the Ralph Lauren doc on HBO? I still haven't seen it. You like, gotta see it. That four people have told me. Thursday like, Howard the Third is in it. Oh, all right, I'm gonna see it uh, when I get back to Yeah, it's a great story. So, yeah, uh, so I always wear the, the guest jeans. Mm-hmm. Tim's and Nike's, mm-hmm. and then everything else was polo. So that was between 1990 or 91 up until 2006. Mm-hmm. So 2006, um, fresh off the plane from uh, the late great Dilla's funeral, mm-hmm. um, my man, oh, our boy, superstar Dave Dar. Shout out to Dave Dar, living his best life in Tampa, Florida. Yep, yep. Those who know, know. <laughs> Those who don't know, don't go to Tampa. Yeah, <laughs> don't go to Tampa. <laughs> don't go to Florida. Period. Just yeah. So 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 Dave Dar hits me up, um, like right before I catch my flight, uh, coming back to New York, and he goes, "Yo, uh, they're, 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 doing, they're doing a, a polo uh, photo shoot, mm-hmm. and I thought about you, and uh, and it was those dudes of uh, vintage gear addicts." Mm-hmm. He said, yo, I want to hook you up with my boy, uh, uh, Rich Boogie, who's mm-hmm. a producer. And he reminds me of you. Like, y'all both make beats. Y'all both collect mm-hmm. records. Shout y'all out to Rich Boogie. Good dude. Yeah, yeah. Uh, authentic. Authentic, and, but, yeah. Now, but now, no, you know he changed his name again. It's like, I think Mono and Stereo or something like that. Which is a fly name. Yeah. But I, he's authentic to me. Shout out to Rich Boogie. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Richard Morning Line. <laughs> um, so, so he wanted us to hook up, and he's like, yo, he, he collects polo just like you, whatever. So I was like, all right, cool, yeah, I'll hook up with him and stuff. And so I go to this, uh, and I get my boy, one of my best friends from Long Island, Des, uh, from Long Island, who's also a low head or whatever. So, you know, we you know we gear up, uh, go to the shoot, and I see a sea of people, you know, of all the low heads and stuff. Right. And I've never been to any of these shoots. Like, I've seen vintage gear acts, like, back when they had their... Um, the website and stuff and I seen all the, the polo stuff but it's I've never been in it mm-hmm. and just seeing all of these people I'm like yo this is like it made me emotional because it brought me back to like high school mm-hmm. and you know at this time it's, now we're talking 2006 mm-hmm. and I'm seeing all these pieces like like some of the pieces I had I sold and I love the, how he's getting emotional over these old over low pieces <laughs> it's yeah. some real New York shit <laughs> nah, straight up <laughs> um, so yeah so, so, so the you know uh what everyone, what a lot of people are saying, like, man, yo, Ralph needs to go back to doing this. Like, mm-hmm. he hasn't made a collection since 94. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and that was, like, the, you know, the common myth. Mm-hmm. And, you know, of which I believed as well. I was like, yeah, you know, like, why hasn't Ralph mm-hmm. made a collection since 94? So, there, so and again, so we're in 2006, and that's that began my web of, mm-hmm. you know, just me going down the rabbit hole. And although I've always worn... I've always had a polo piece on, like, mm-hmm. or a polo or, like, my outerwear mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, my hat and sweater or shirt. But my bottoms were always, like, well, by this time I upgraded to diesel jeans. 
Shout out to Kanye. I used to sell diesel jeans. Oh, yeah. Oh, and then, and then, <laughs> then he upgraded me again to uh, Ernest Sones. Ernest Sone jeans. I remember yeah. that era. That was hot for like a year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, my Tim's and, and my Nikes. The, my, my first thing, my first thought was like, yo, I want I want to get all of this gear that, you know, all these low heads are like going crazy for. Mm-hmm. You know, so eBay. Mm-hmm. So I'm going on eBay, getting sniped at the last second mm-hmm. on, you know, um, you know, uh, on these old pieces. So I was like, all right, well, obviously I can't buy all of these old pieces. So let me just focus on one collection. Like, mm-hmm. right, let me just do the P-Wing. So I was gra- I was getting some P-Wing sp- things here and there and here and there. But it's so intricate. This is- oh, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a, it, was a, it was a thing. Yeah, it's a whole culture. Yeah. So so when when I realized, like, yo, I can't you know, get all of P-Wing because it just doesn't exist mm-hmm. anymore. And I'm thinking like, man, why? Yeah. Now I'm getting frustrated. Like, yo, why did Ralph stop making collections? So long story short, I started to go, you know, me being a music producer, like, you know, I had all the time in the world. <laughs> you know, um, uh, when I didn't have to, excuse me, take care of my daughter, uh, yeah, watch my daughter and stuff like, I would just go to Macy's, go mm-hmm. to Macy's, go to Bloomingdale's, go to uh, the Rob, to the mansion. And I would just be there and just observe and, you know, just look at the gear. So long story short, I went to Macy's one day and I noticed that they're like the the polos and the, the polo shirts and the cable knit sweaters and then the chino pants and all that stuff. Like those, you know, in all sorts of colors, those are lined up on the outskirts of this display. Mm-hmm. And the display, like there was a theme behind the display. And, you know, I was putting it together. I was like, it was kind of like an aviator thing. Right. Uh, but it's kind of a nautical thing because they had like the the captain's wheel and stuff like that. Um, so I asked the woman, I was like, yeah, you know, what's going on with these with this clothes right here? Like, you know, what's this all about? And I'm reading the tags, and she's like, oh yeah, that's a naval utility. I was like, is what? And she goes, oh yeah, this is our new collection. I was like, collection? Right. Hey, what do you mean collection? Oh no, this is this is for spring uh, 2006. It's a collection called Naval Utility. I said, oh, so this is a collection? And I'm saying like, I'm, I'm sounding right, like right. an idiot. But I'm, She's but, not understanding your passion, when yeah. it, the reason behind the, asking her the question. Yeah, and the thing is, like, again, we're in 2006. Everyone, like, all the low heads, like, yo, Ralph hasn't made a collection 94. since 94. So she tells me, she's like, no, uh, he puts out three collections every year, uh, each season of every mm-hmm. year. And I'm like, excuse me? Mm-hmm. And squeeze me? <laughs> um, yeah, so so then I started, I started buying the stuff. And, you know, so I'll buy it, like, top dollar or whatever. And, you know... Money was kind of scary, so I'll buy it, take it home, study it, study the tag, and then I'll take it back and get my money back. <laughs> and I was doing I this. I thought you were going to be like Thurston. I was with Thurston just recently, uh, <laughs> and, and he had on some ill low shit, and the dude was, who was with us, he's like, yo, um, that's ill. I, I would buy it off your back. Thurston was like, you want to buy it? Yo, I sell everything, bro. I sell everything. You can have whatever. What do you want? <laughs> Name your price. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, so I started like, actually studying it, and I was, and I'd be, I, like, my intrigue just grew. Cause now I'm thinking about it like collect, like collector's items and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And then, um, yeah, so then my, my, you know, from asking questions and then like I'm relating questions uh, from one sales rep to another who mm-hmm. didn't know. Mm-hmm. And then my product knowledge started to expand. Mm-hmm. So I started teaching sales reps, <laughs> like, you know, it got, it got to a point where I was getting frustrated that they didn't know what they were selling. Right. right. I mean, it was like, it was closed. Like, nah, this is this collection and right. it's from this season. And the- this, this reminds me of the time I went to Arthur Treacher's in Cincinnati once. And I was like, pulled up. I said, what kind of fish y'all got? And they was like, fried. No. And I was like, no, 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 no. See, there's different fishes in the sea. I want to know which one I'm. Did you say fishes? Yeah. You know, some years ago. Yeah. So, so from 2006 and on, I, I swore. I said, you know what? Uh, you know, now that I know about the collections and stuff, I'm never wearing mm. any other brand name. So I gave all of my diesel Ernest Owens to my nephews, my Nikes and Tims. So from 2006 to present day, like not only do like I like I wear Ralph Lauren Polo, but I actually study the collections right. and I and I've taught myself. I figured out how to shop for it. So my collections have grown. Whereas like so, this collection right here, this is um, this is from uh, last fall. It's called. Uh, Great outdoors. So I own about a little over eighty uh, pieces from this collection. So I, so I own all but like seven pieces from the whole collection, from the entire collection. <laughs> uh, talk to me about your relationship with Mac Miller. Oh yeah, Mac. Um, rest in peace to Mac. Rest in peace to Mac Miller. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I met Mac 
at uh, I feel like it was uh, from what I can remember. I think it was like Camp Flognaw mm-hmm. years ago, uh, probably twenty fourteen or so. And uh, I knew who he was, and but I hadn't really heard his music. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I knew he was good, and I knew he was popping or whatever. And he recognized me, which I was surprised, you know, because mm-hmm. uh, he was a kid. Yeah. He called me to be on a song with him. He was studying what we were doing in that raucous era. Yeah. 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 So we so we linked up and like I knew that he was big on the internet, but I didn't realize how big he was, mm-hmm. like as far as like his fan base or whatever. So, you know, uh we linked up, you know, but and we did the whole like, oh yeah, yeah, they should exchange mm-hmm. numbers and stuff. I didn't think he'd ever hit me up or whatever. And I'm thinking like if I if I were to ever hit him up you know, I'd probably, like, you know, see that he's in town and somebody wants to go to his show. Mm-hmm. And, you know, right. Yeah. Hey, yo, uh, you know Mac Miller? You think you could? Uh, um, <laughs> the voices. Yeah, you know, that's how all my friends sound. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, I, you know, so I didn't think he'd ever hit me up or whatever. Um, and uh, he made a visit to New York. And he's like, hey, you know, I'm in New York. Or I'm coming. Either he was there or he was coming through. He was like, um, can you come through the studio and, you know, you know, bring some shit with you? I was mm-hmm. like, all right, cool. We get there, we link, and then I'm, you know, I, I don't know how he was, you know, how other people were around him, but I was completely myself. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as talkative as I am now, mm-hmm. talked his ears off as well. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, uh, you know, you know, of course, on the first meeting, like, we're here in the studio, we're doing the whole beats thing or whatever, I'm playing playing beats and stuff like that. And then um, and then I, I didn't realize how hilarious he was. Mm. Mm-hmm. Like off off the cuff, he's like extremely hilarious, and so we we're like hitting hitting each other off with jokes and stuff, and yeah, we just formed a, a pretty cool friendship there to the point where, um, you know, eventually like we start texting each other, or he's like he'll hit me up about stuff outside of music, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know when when I got on my weight loss thing where you know, uh, and he saw that I was like he would hit me up like you know he he followed me on Instagram and he would see photos of me like. Yo, how like are you losing weight? Like how how is this happening? Like what are you doing? And I would tell him I was like, Some oh, I got this routine. Tea. Little tummy tea, you know, <laughs> little uh, waist trainer. <laughs> Spanks. <laughs> Spanks. I'm dying. Spanks. <laughs> no. Um Yeah, so so we we actually became friends. Mm. And uh you know, and and I I didn't I didn't see him often, but the few times that he came to New York, oh, and then he moved to New York and stuff and uh yeah, it, it was just a, it was just a real cool relationship. Like we wound up doing like in the history of our friendship, you know, we wound up recording like five songs together. Mm-hmm. Um, That's life was just yeah. released uh, after he passed away. Yeah, yeah. Ah. Rest in peace to Mac Miller, man. Yes, rest um, in peace. It's good I got one more question for you, and yeah. I feel like this one is for the producers. Okay, for hip hop producers who really like the sound and era that we come from. Yeah, yeah. you started on the ASR. Mm-hmm. You. Honed your craft on an MPC 3000. Mm-hmm. I remember watching High Tech go from the MPC 60 to the 3000. Uh, Pete Rock, wasn't he like SP 1200 dude or a 950? Yeah, yeah, or? yeah, 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 SP 1200, 950. And then, uh, and then I think, I remember seeing videos of him using the 2000. I don't know what he's using The now. MPC 2000? Yeah, he's using the MPC 2000. So now yeah. break down sort of the differences in these, those, these are drum machines now, right? Mm-hmm. The drum machines and how important they are to that sound mm-hmm. and which one, is there one that you feel like everyone needs to master? No, as far as mastering, I think you should just master what you're most comfortable using, because Madlib, Madlib is making beats on the laptop. Yeah, mm-hmm. or the the, uh, the iPad. Yeah, the yeah. iPad. Garage yeah. Band. Yeah, no, like that. Well, I don't know what he's using, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, yeah, I just like, he said he made most of that bandana album on, on the, iPad. the iPad, and we got I got Madlib beats on a new Blackstar album, which I should play you that. Oh, one hundred percent. I don't get to hear that yet, but I should play yeah. you that. <laughs> I'm hearing it. You know I'm, I'm coming but in. Yeah, keep going. Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So I, 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 because essentially they all pretty much do the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just your mastery of getting, like, knowing how to like use what it offers. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, I, to be honest, I've never gotten into like being able to really distinguish certain sounds. And you know, like we, people were like, well, this has more swing than that. Mm-hmm. I was like, I remember when I first came out, the MPC and the SP were competing for our attention. Yeah, yeah. And I could tell 
Oh, well, I mean, yeah. Between th- those th- two th- machines. Yeah, those were leaps and bounds between yeah. each other and stuff like that. I could be um, like, that beat was made on an SP, that beat was made on an MP. I can't tell no more. Yeah, because, like, they're all, I feel like they're all just chasing each other's tails at this mm-hmm. point. Like, I mean, you know, certain companies are, like, you know, fashion their equipment off of other companies. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, shout outs to uh, uh, Akai Professional. Mm hmm. Um, the NPC makers. Uh, shout out to Roger Lynn. Roger Lynn. Yep. Yep. Huge. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, to, to be honest, like, I, I don't even get into, you know, what's better and you know, and, or what has more features because I've heard kids making beats off of, you know, certain equipment that I'm just like, like mm-hmm. I, like I shouldn't even be trying to do this anymore. Right. You know. Sh- shout outs to uh, Illingsworth. You ever, mm-hmm. you ever heard of? No. You put me on just now. Man, yo, Illingsworth, I want twenty percent of you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, nah, these, these these kids are using like uh, the most minimal stuff and mm. making the most incredible stuff. Ain't that hip hop though? It is. It is. That's that's where we come from. Eighty eight keys is hip hop. Eighty eight keys, people's party. Give it up. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys.